Hello and welcome to the new Center for Research and Practice seminar series, formalizing the subject, dialectics and cybernetics in Cahiers pour l'analyse and the CCRU with Danielle Sassenboto. I will begin by providing a brief description of the course and a bio for the instructor, and then I will open the floor for Danielle. This seminar examines two unique think tanks to emerge in philosophy in the last 50 years, the Calle Pulaelis and the Cybernetic Research Cultural Unit. These two research groups paved the way to an unprecedented experimental and interdisciplinary practice, which reconfigured the classical philosophical dichotomy between rationalism and empiricism in the wake of new advances in the sciences and the arts. They also opened a lever to overcome the stale dichotomy between analytic and continental approaches in the contemporary context. As we shall see, both vectors of study are not just accidentally paired, but can be seen as two folds that answer in divergent ways to an integral and cohesive set of imperatives, following thus overlapping theoretical and practical aims. Central among these was the pursuit of a formal and interdisciplinary experimentalism, leading to an uncompromising rejection of postmodern relativism and of the post Heideggerian phenomenological legacy, including its historicist and Derridaean textualist sequels. In doing so, both vectors conceived of parallel projects for a thorough formalization of the subject. This would overcome the residual humanist piety which lingered in the 20th century philosophical attempts to radicalize the critical impetus of enlightenment rationality. Using either mathematical formalization or cybernetic functional mappings outside the realm of regulated scientific practice, they led to varied figurations of the post-human future and a reconsideration of the scope of the revolutionary process after Marx. These convergences, however, also reveal a crucial methodological dividing line within which diametrically different views about the relationship between the subject and the world are forged, and within which the future of collective, quote unquote, humanity becomes problematized. Thus, as we shall see, the Cahier followed above all the anti-humanist spirit of the Lacanian attack on the figurations of ego psychology in an attempt to reintegrate these into the philosophical imaginary in continuity with the Althusserian rekindling of the philosophical dialectic and the revolutionary subject in the horizon of structuralist thought. It also expanded the formal epistemological orientation developed by Bachelard and others. In doing so, they would take mathematical semiotic formalization as the means to reconceive of the traditional aims of philosophy in its materialist scope and of the Marxist-oriented revolutionary subject. In turn, the CCRU exploited an alternative schizoanalytic model and the machinic ontology closely aligned to the works of Villas and Gotari against the perceived idealist and structuralist excess of Lacanian psychoanalysis, exacerbating the anti-humanist impetus for unearthing an impersonal subjectivity, which could not be reconciled with traditional forms of revolutionary practice. Accordingly, decanting all residual vitalist or humanist tropes from the Deleuzean text. The CCRU progressively produced aberrant theory fictional mythologies in which cybernetic theory and non-mathematical numeracies serve to construct a hyperstitional practice that resisted recapture by the traditional valences of philosophical narrativization. They ultimately forecasted a productive intellectual mechanism 
not traceable, not tractable to the resources of deliberative cognition or recollective resistance within which human temporality was not only dislodged from a phenomenological individual horizon, but precluded the possibility of incorporation into a communal subject guided by normative historical imperatives. Finally, we shall extend our study into the historical antecedents which guide both of these trajectories, as well as their prescient influence in the contemporary philosophical landscape across a variety of registers. This seminar begins with an introductory session providing the historical and theoretical background guiding our investigation. During the following two weeks, we shall examine a variety of texts from the Cahiers pour l'analyse, following closely the debate centered around the relation between structure, concept, and form. This interrogation leads to profound questions concerning the legacy of structuralism and the role of mathematical formalization beyond its narrow application in the social sciences and psychoanalysis, probing the limits and interface of scientific and philosophical practice. During the following two sessions, we shall engage with the recently published collected writings from the CCRU in a systemic manner and trace its attempt to forge a hyperstitional practice in which Lovecraftian mythology and cybernetics converge towards the experimental practice of theory fiction in which Deleuze and Qatari's machinic ontology becomes subverted from a philosophical register into an alien register. During weeks six and seven, we will examine some of the contemporary ramifications of these two think tanks by focusing on two factors of research within philosophy and theory in which the influence and tensions between their orientations of becoming prescient and intensified a the speculative realist sequence and b the so-called neo-rationalist resurgence of universalist systematic philosophy in which one also finds a re-evaluation of the legacies of modern rationalism and empiricism after the 20th century deconstruction of metaphysics and critique of enlightenment rationality. Finally, in the last session, we will briefly consider the emergence and development of different versions and political inflections of the accelerationist program and the practical horizon within which the future draws its gradient therefrom. Okay, so that is our summary for the course. And now, very quickly, I will provide a bio of our instructor. So, Danielle Sassiloto is a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA. His research focuses on the fields of contemporary philosophy and Latin American literature. In particular, his research focuses on the reconciliation of rationalism and materialism and the methodological relationship between epistemology and ontology in contemporary philosophy. He is currently finishing a full-length monograph in tentatively titled Saving the Noumenon, an essay on the foundations of ontology, in which he proposes a critical reading of the ontological term in contemporary philosophy and lays the foundations for a new transcendental epistemology. Chiefly inspired by the works of Wilfred Sellers, Robert Brandom, Alain Badou, Lorenz Puntel, Ray Brassier, Reza Nagarastani, and Jay Rosenberg. All right, well, that is enough for me. So please, Danielle, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hello. I knew a few of you, but uh, I know I don't know 
another good chunk of you. Uh, so yeah, uh, a couple of things have changed. I mean, I presume all of you have the syllabus or have taken a look at the syllabus. Um, I've expanded it a little bit, just to include some things there that I thought would be interesting. Today we'll go over that, obviously. Um, before we get started with anything substantive, uh, I would just like to introduce ourselves, uh, respectively, to say who you are, uh, your background, what's your interest in the course. And by the way, I'm, I'm sorry if it's a little shaky. I'm, I'm having to use a smaller computer this for this session just because my other one is wonky today. Um, I need to take it to a shop. So if it's a little shaky, please forgive me. Next time it will be more stable. Um, but yeah, maybe to get us started, we can just say who we are, what's our interest in the course, our background. And please let me know. Hello? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and also please, one thing that I really do want to know is uh, how extensive, uh, what your philosophical background is. So I want to know uh, just like how much philosophy you're familiar with, just so that I can, you know, not be too elementary or too specialized. So yeah, whoever wants to go first, maybe we can start with Eric. Hello. Hey, uh, does everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. So, hi, I'm Eric. I'm new to the New Center. Uh, just got a scholarship for the certificate to, uh, program. And um, I'm currently in, uh, in Germany, the small town called Bad Salzuflen. It's, it's like uh, two and a half hours from Hamburg, basically. And I study sociology and philosophy in Bielefeld. And um, Philosophically, my main interests are the connections or the implications of the really, really founda foundational philosophical questions for social and political theory. That was always what imp impressed me the most. And I've got, a, I've got a quite a bit good basic understanding, I think, of post-structuralism and also read a bit of Zizek already. Like, um, okay, we, we all were at GDEC, but I, I started to get to, into him a little bit more thematically. So, and also know a little bit about um, CCIU, uh, accelerationism, um, all that background. But I'm, I cannot really say how much I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, surprised, I'm excited to know how much I already know and uh, what I can learn here. So, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Um, maybe Alan can go next. I'm just going by order, <coughs> I guess, from what I said. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alan. I'm uh, finishing. I, this is my last uh, credits to finish the certificate uh, in the new center. I am an architect from Mexico City. And, well, um, my philosophical background is, uh, um, I guess, like relating to this course, I'm familiar with, with the stuff we're going to see, but I've never had the chance to like delve deeper, either in the CCRU or uh, even less with the careers. So it's a good opportunity. And well, I've been following Daniel's seminars for a while. So yeah, I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, maybe Eken or Aiken? Aiken, yes. Aiken, Aiken. Yes, nice to meet you, Daniel. We've spoken on Facebook a little bit. It's nice to hear your voice. Uh, yes, my name is Ekin. Uh, I was originally trained in analytic philosophy um, and then made the switch to primarily continental philosophy. Uh, I studied uh, media studies at Columbia for graduate school. Um, I would say that I, I We've spoken a little bit, maybe you know my interests nominally at least. I, uh, I've published a bit on Laurel and Stiegler primarily. Uh, I've been following a generally a post you know, contemporary Derridians like Malibu and Stiegler closely. Um, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with uh, you know, the, the, the philosophers and theorists and such that we'll be uh, examining, but I'm interested in this comparative model between. CCRU and Cajas, so look forward to it. Um, Jack? Hi, everyone. I'm Jack. Um, I live in Los Angeles. 
Uh, my background is in uh, my BA is in uh, English literature from Reed College. And then I studied uh, art and technology and integrated media at CalArts. Um, my background with philosophy is semi-formal, taking some critical classes, aesthetics classes um, through school and all of that, um, as well as informal, just pursuing some of these readings on my own. Um, fairly familiar with the CCRU works or the, I don't know, constituent writers as a uh, part of the group. Um, and recently I've been reading, uh, I've been in the Deleuze class with um, Reza and Adam, as a few of us are, I know. Um, yeah, other than that, i um, excited to learn more and uh, see what everyone else has to share, so. Let's see, who else? Uh, Stefano? Yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm using the news center. I'm Stefano. I am from Milan, Italy. I did my bachelor degree in uh, philosophy at the University of Milan. And then I moved to Warwick, where I did my master's degree in continental philosophy with a dissertation on what I called experimental metaphysics. That is a kind of thought that would be placed alongside scientific analysis and uh, um, endeavors in investigating into reality and in which speculation and uh, empiricism encounter themselves newly. I'm now working on an ontology and the phenomenology of thought, of thinking, drawing mainly from uh, Husserl, Heidegger and Deleuze. And so I'm working on questions such as what is thinking and what we actually do when we are thinking. So yes, that's it. That's pretty much for now, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jared? Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, this is my final course with the New Center and my program, uh, third course with Daniel. Uh, so my philosophical uh, training before that, um, I had some exposure to, to phenomenology and hermeneutics, and deconstruction and the rhetoric department at UC Berkeley. I uh, primarily Nietzsche, Foucault, Heidegger. Uh, I did a research project on morphogenesis as articulated in uh, A Thousand Plateaus, although kind of in the end more so along the lines of uh, Delanda's interpretation of that. This was years ago. And then I got into the work of uh, Quentin Mayasu and Ray Brassier when it was closer to have come out, like around 2011. And then I took a long break in which I really didn't pursue philosophy very consistently at all. Um, until basically coming back to the New Center courses um, to the extent that I can isolate Oh, I will say uh, I'm a little bit familiar with CCRU. Um, read some passages from Feng Noumena um, by Nick Lan, um, a bit of Kodloeshan's More Brilliant in the Sun. That's more his uh, music criticism. Uh, but uh, I have no uh, long-term research projects at this time. So I'm just still working that out. Cool. Um, let's see who's next. Stasha? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'm uh, new to the, uh, to the new center. So uh, I have just joined. And uh, I finished my uh, MA in contemporary art theory and goldsmith. And uh, my dissertation was uh, mainly concerned with uh, cyber feminism in Russia. And uh, concerning uh, the um, topic of the seminar, I've been uh, reading a little bit of. Uh, Mm, of, of, well, I've, I've been obviously reading a lot of uh, Sadie Plant. Uh, I've been reading uh, a bit of Steve Goodman, and uh, I'm sorry. And like uh, Jared, I was uh, 
amazed uh, uh, with um, uh, the writings of uh, Kojwe Shun. Uh, so, but uh, I haven't really uh, looked uh, into uh, CSRU as uh, a collective, although I did read uh, some of their texts. And uh, currently I'm uh, most interested in uh, the uh, projects of uh, rationality. So, like, this is mainly, uh, and uh, also, uh, like, um, so far, uh, the writings of uh, Caesarian members uh, have been uh, mainly the context uh, to my uh, research, rather than uh, the center of it. So, I would be, I'm really, really excited to look at them uh, more carefully and more properly, I suppose. That's it. Cool. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Uh, Daryl? Hello, uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Northern Canada. Uh, I work at Athabasca University. Uh, I got a master's in arts and integrated studies from Athabasca University. Um, my philosophy trajectory, uh, I, I read extensively through Nietzsche to help my, me break away from religion. Um, and since then, uh, I probably mostly read uh, Badiou pretty extensively. Uh, I've gotten myself familiar with La Ruelle in the last year. Uh, of course, a smattering of Deleuze. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, Daniel helping, I guess, myself trying to make this reconciliation between um, empiricism and rationalism. Uh, taking one course with Daniel. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, trying to sort that out somewhere. Uh, Hernan? Yes, hello. Um, I'm actually from Argentina, but right now I'm in New York um, for a while visiting some, some family. So yeah, beautiful here. Well, I'll, I'll try to, to meet up with James, but he's, he's quite busy right now. No, we will, we will. You will? That, that's fine, that's fine. I'm just kidding. Um, so my background, my formal training is in biochemistry and biotechnology. Uh, my training in philosophy is quite limited. I did a, a year of seminars um, in the University of Buenos Aires, and now I'm halfway through uh, the new center uh, program. And I would say that my, my interest is in uh, Deleuzean ontology, um, specifically the notion of intensity and how that might inform uh, the genesis of representation um, and the naturalization of consciousness. So, yeah, that's about it. Absolutely. Uh, Alexei, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, sorry, I had some technical problems. I just jumped in last moment. So my name is Alexei. I live in Helsinki. I just graduated from program uh, Intercultural Encounters, MA program at the University of Helsinki. So my background is mostly in post-colonial, decolonial gender studies, but more recently I've been doing uh, post-humanism and new materialism. I have an interest in geology of media. Uh, so now I'm kind of exploring and expanding a little bit my research interest because I want to pursue my uh, PhD in a little bit different direction. So yeah, uh, I'm really interested in this course and it looks like uh, really what I want to do in the future. So I'm looking forward. Uh, Valentin? Hi guys. Um, I just got I just got home finally. Um, uh, I I've, I'm from Russia. I live in Berlin. I uh, I don't know a tourist. Um, I'm not very good with institutions, but I studied a lot of philosophy. Uh, in Cicero, particularly, I'm a big fan of uh, Plant. Uh, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Luciano Parisi, and, but I, however, I can't say that I have any kind of good, uh, I wouldn't be able to explain what I think CCRU's overall main idea would be, or how, how I would like, I have no clue how to even begin answering the question, which is in the title of the seminar, like what would be the theory of the subject proposed by CCRU. 
So I'm really looking forward to learn more about this. And I think uh, Federico. And yeah, Federico. Hello? Um, hi. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I, I was having a lot of technical issues. I had to get another computer. I'm, I'm, re I'm really sorry. No worries. Um, so, the master's degree in philosophy in, in La Universidad Nacional of Colombia, in National University of Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, I have had an undergraduate in visual arts and I'm currently training uh, to do my dissertation, a master's uh, degree on, on the subject of anti-humanism and uh, Jacques Derrida. Um, I chose, let's say, uh, to, to go into the field of philosophy because I saw that in arts, uh, we usually have like this fetishistic uh, way of seeing theory and philosophy. So I wanted to get something more serious. And they actually want to get like really deep into into theory and philosophy. Like, um, well, they started with uh, with uh, post-structuralism, and uh, I found out about the New Center because of uh, my readings of K-punk uh, in my teen years. And uh, I'm trying to to go backwards, like go through through the analytics as well and uh, ancient philosophy. I have a lot of um, voids uh, in my knowledge, so I, I want to get further into into philosophy. I'm, I'm considering um, doing a, a PhD, and uh, I'm thinking about about the subject of uh, the machinic, the machinic uh, agency. Mm -hmm. uh, so try to get a, an analytic view of uh, anti edipian uh, Deleuzian machinic subjectivity, but from an analytic point of view. I would like to work this uh, with the new center as well. Fantastic. And uh, maybe finally our organizers can just briefly say, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm a um, student at the new center for research and practice. And I'm also a master's student at the new school for social research. Um, I'm interested in this class because you know, I think it, it does coincide with my research somewhat. I'm interested in uh, kind of the intersection between different forms of mathematics, design, uh, transgenderism, and anti-humanism, especially like biohacking, bio art, kind of defiguring and refiguring the body. And uh, I am definitely like an unhinged anti-humanist, so I'm definitely interested in uh, discussing the different strains of anti-humanism that we'll discuss in uh, this summer. Fantastic. Um, I think Mo just joined. I presume everybody knows Mo, but maybe Mo, can you just, for those of us. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so let me just turn the camera on maybe because it's rude to not have a camera on. Hello? I'm Actually, let me, let me close my window because it, there's noise coming from outside because there's a construction sorry, side. Okay. One second. I don't know. Canadians love to say sorry. I just said sorry. I haven't done anything wrong, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Great. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Mohamed Salami. I'm the organizer of the new center. I joined because I really love to be able to join the first session of the most seminars and i'm really curious about how you will you will like um, conduct this seminar because it really has a lot to do with what i what i inquire but also i'm really interested in in the other organization not ccru that you're going to cover and also knowing you i Basically, I even said it on Facebook that like every seminar you teach, it becomes also a different type of history of metaphysics. So I'm interested to learn more from you, really. And it's like amazing and wonderful to have you. Thank you, Mo. Wonderful to have you too. Hopefully you can stick around. Um, so yeah, as Mo just said, I, 
one of the things that I like to do when I organize seminars in general is to uh, follow some broad genealogy that can sort of situate whatever it is we're talking about in the larger history of philosophy and history of ideas. And those of you who have taken uh, seminars with me before will know that there's a basic template, historical template that I tend to work within that helps me sort of map certain basic metaphysical, ontological, and uh, epistemological questions that are foundational for philosophical questioning. So um, in, in, in today's introductory section, session, I'm, I'm going to rehearse some of these uh, mo large motifs because in a way they come, they you know, reemerge in this seminar in a new corpus, in a new uh, body of work. So those of you who have taken uh, you know, previous seminars with me, I ask for a slight patience uh, if we revisit some things that you've already heard before. But of course, m most of what I want to do today really is give a bit of theoretical and historical background to the, this, well, to, to the two think tanks that we're gonna be addressing first. And second, I want to really uh, bring home the central contention of the seminar as a, as a, as, as a topic. So uh, I try to think of seminars not just as surveys of particular materials, but they're always organized around an idea. And I suppose the central idea here in this for this seminar is that upon looking at these two think tanks more closely and studying their ramifications, I came to realize that this is not just an accidental pairing. Uh, this is not just an arbitrary you know, cluster of, of thinkers that you can sort of talk about together, but they are very much uh, in the contemporary context representative of an iteration of a classical motif in philosophy, which is the longstanding historical battle between rationalism and empiricism in the contemporary context. So I want to explain why I say this in a little bit more detail. And uh, I, I, I know that my camera is doing that weird flickery thing, but uh, this is the first time I've used this uh, software. So I, again, apologies. I'll, I'll get the technical details sorted out by next time. Regardless, uh, so I want to basically clarify the central contention, which is how it is that empiricism and rationalism find themselves reiterated in this new configuration in these two think tanks. And I also want to introduce the kind of general uh, conceptual framework that will allow us to look at these materials uh, in general. So there will be a little bit of history of philosophy. I will also speak in a very cursory and introductory manner about each of the two think tanks we're gonna be covering. I'll say gen on, on, in the most general possible sense, what I think uh, you know, we, we're going to sort of get out of it and what the central structure of each of the two sort of think tanks is. And uh, we'll get into logistics towards the end um, about what, you know, just what exactly is involved in the course. Now, what, what, one little bit of information, and this out of focus thing is really annoying, I really apologize. But um, as I mentioned before, uh, you probably all have taken a look at the syllabus. I've, I've decided to amplify the syllabus slightly so that we're not ending where we thought we were, <laughs> uh, which was uh, the accelerationist, sort of left and right accelerationist uh, vectors. But I've included a, a module, a final module on xenofeminism, because I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a peculiarly interesting um, think tank on its own right. But obviously it's been influenced by both of the think tanks that we are going to be primarily serving. And uh, so, I mean, we'll, we'll have a chance to look at the syllabus in more detail. So we'll talk, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But um, for now, what, what I'll do now is uh, as, as usual, those of you who know me, I'm, I'm, I'm old fashioned in the sense that I, I like PowerPoint. I know it's kind of tacky and people think PowerPoint is something you know, that you shouldn't use anymore. But I, I kind of use it because I think it's, regardless, helpful to, to keep my train of thought in one piece. Um, so I'll be projecting a, a slideshow and just with some bullet points that I'll be you know, going over. I'll be stopping periodically for questions and comments. So please, at any point in time, if anything's not clear or if there are any technical issues, obviously just jump in. Um, and if anything you want to just like comment, ask, it's, there's no wrong time to do it. Okay? Um, any any preliminaries anything anybody wants to say before we start jumping in um, I have a question concerning the PowerPoint um, 
<laughs> are you planning on uh, uploading them into the classroom? Yes, I, I, <laughs> the, the rule of thumb is after this, each session, I will uh, be uploading um, the PowerPoint to the, to the classroom. To the okay, thanks. Cool. Oh, uh, Daniel, and also, Daniel, yes? Daniel, can you, can you, uh, it's Daryl here, can you explain, um, do you, are you presenting this as if one side of this poll is a corrective to the other, or are you trying to synthesize them? Uh, so, I, one of the things I will, we will be exploring is how some of the thinkers that are influenced by both vectors, like for example, Ray Brassier, in a certain way is trying to come out of both in a conciliatory fashion, or in any case, trying to sort of find out what's most uh, intelligible and productive about both ends of the spectrum. As I set up the connection between the two, which is of course indirect largely, it is not that one it, it presents directly itself as an alternative, as a, as, as, as a corrective to the other, but that both can be seen as alternative takes or as competing research programs, if you will, in a, in, in a broader sense. And really, I mean, we'll get into more precise detail as to what is the real sort of uh, common nook that sort of pieces them together and just spoiler alert, I guess, but it's materialism. As we will see, both the CCRU and the KA are very much interested in rekindling materialism in a, in, a, in a new register informed by new advances in the social, natural, and formal sciences. Yet they have very di radically divergent conceptions of what materiality is and what kinds of methods one can use to reconstitute and reforge materialism. So accordingly, what we will get is a reiteration of very classical philosophical uh, contrast between empiricism and rationalism in a properly metaphysical and ontological register in which these two think tanks propose widely divergent conceptions of materiality of being but also widely different conceptions of the subject and i think in a certain way the subject is in a, in a way more important than being in in in, in the other because and thus the title of the seminar, of course, formalizing the subject. The Cayers is obviously older and uh, comes first, and it emerges in the context of a very heated, obvious uh, discussion with psychoanalysis, with structural psychoanalysis, Lacan, of course. And of course, this Lacanian, uh, the, the psychoanalytic concern is tapped back into philosophy via Althusser and via the interest of the Althusserian school to rekindle the valences of the dialectical materialist method. Uh, so there's this question of collective agency and psychoanalytical agency. The subject understood not only as a individual or as the psyche or as the unconscious of the individual, but more broadly as how to reconstitute or rethink collective subjectivity, right? So this is obviously at the core of what the Cahiers is exploring, how to reconstitute the concept of the subject in the wake of these advances. On the other hand, the CCRU is likewise concerned with the concept of subjectivity, but it is, on the other hand, indebted to what we will see is the Delosio Guattarian schizoanalytic model. And this comes with its own ontolo ontology, of course. Now, what the thinkers in the CAE do with, with Lacanian psychoanalysis coming out of it, and what the thinkers from the CCRU do with Deleuze and Guattari is in large part heretical and in large part conciliatory or, or in tune with their masters and with their predecessors. I'm sure you, or I'm not sure, but uh, Ray Brassier coined a wonderful phrase when describing the work of Nick Land as mad black delusionism. Mad black delusionism. And it, this is, a, I think, a, an iteration on an expression by a philosopher called uh, um, uh, What's his first name? I don't know. Gilles Decombe, whatever. But Decombe, who, who called, um, who, who did he call mad black? Whatever, it doesn't matter. But he okay, called, mad. He called Deleuze a mad black Heideggerian, right? No, I think it's, I, he, I mean, that I might think be true. It was Hegelianism. Yeah, something mad black Hegelianism. That's yeah. what I remember. But, but yeah, who yeah. was the mad black Hegelian? Uh, Deleuze? Deleuze. Uh, the Deleuze and Guattari. 
You're right. Yes, exactly. Leo Charles Libidino Economy and, and Guattari and Deleuze and Guattari's uh, yeah, machine ontology. So yeah, Ray Brassier makes this kind of uh, contention that what you find in Nick Lamb's work is this kind of transvaluation of Deleuze and Guattari and uh, machine ontology and vitalism into a kind of completely complete inhumanist register. And I think that the CCRU, to the extent that it's, of course, extremely, very much influenced by Lance's work, is uh, in the same spirit. It's a kind of mad black transvaluation of Deleuze, Deleuze, Guattari, and schizoanalysis and machinic ontology into an anti-philosophical register. Anti-philosophical is an uh, anti-philosophy, of course, in the sense that uh, Alain Badiou coins the term, which basically means it's, a, it's within the genre of philosophy, after all. It addresses itself to philosophy. It speaks of philosophers, and it talks about the topics that philosophers talk about. But in its discursive status, it tries to consolidate itself as a discourse outside of philosophy, right? I mean, the, the classical examples in, in modernity, of course, Nietzsche is the great anti-philosopher who claims to be waging against the whole of the philosophical tradition. And Badiou claims that Lacan is an anti-philosopher. And I think, of course, today, the, I mean, this is a contention that I make in my work is that um, Nick Land, in a way, is our, is, is our Nietzsche, is our great anti-philosopher, the great anti-philosopher of our day. And in this regard, the CCRU is this collective which does not exactly, I mean, wants to position itself outside of the, regulate, the strictures of philosophical discourse proper, but of course it is still um, woven with or ins inscribed within a philosophical register. And similarly, in the Cahiers, even though Lacan, again, the great, you know, according to Badiou, the great anti-philosopher that any contemporary philosopher, he claims, Badiou, would have to traverse. Uh, this has, you know, I call any philosophy contemporary that has the courage to traverse the anti-philosophy of Lacan, he says. In, 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 but this is, in fact, the project of the Cahiers, in a certain sense. But you would join later, and we'll go through the through the through the historical details in a little bit more uh, detail in a bit. But one of the thing, one way to understand the project in the Cahiers is precisely to try to reincorporate into philosophy what was precisely a challenge to philosophy seen from psychoanalysis, issued from psychoanalysis. And uh, as we'll see, this, this, this is also because philosophy in the 40s and 50s was progressively leading itself to a kind of crisis, a dual crisis. On the one hand, there was the psychoanalytic challenge waged by Lacan. On the other hand, in the post-war period, as you are all probably familiar, there was a great uh, suspicion about philosophy generated by the post-Heideggerian school and you know, the historicism that emerged ever since, which basically wanted to call game over. The philosophy had exhausted its at least classical pretensions to consolidate itself as a kind of universal discourse, as an ontology, as a discourse on being, probably whatever we want. And so this, the fact of these, of this rhetoric, of this rhetoric of the end of metaphysics, the end of philosophy, the death of philosophy, which of course is, is very much echoed in post-war France by thinkers like Derrida, even Foucault flicks with this at certain points, and um, Sartre, of course, and what we find is that there's this attempt to reconstitute philosophy after its crisis in the first half of the 20th century, after Heidegger, and after, of course, the, the practical and human catastrophe of two world wars. So I think that is another, uh, you know, an, another way to look at this. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself, and all, I'm all over the place right now, because I'm, I'm actually going to go through these points in a little bit more organized detail. But... Uh, yeah, any, any, anything else anybody wants to say before we uh, start looking at slides? <laughs> Daniel, do you know Medli Belham Khajian? No, he's, I do not. He's uh, one of Badu's philo uh, philosophy students, and he, he has an interesting anti-philosophy stance. You may be interested in his, in his writing. Very, very much so. I mean, send me the reference. I'll, 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 uh, I shall, yeah. I shall. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Anybody else wants to say anything uh, before we jump into the to the oceans to drown? Okay, cool. So um, let me let me project. I have to share. That's pretty much the same. I mean, I hope I hope Google is Zoom uh, owned by Google. Incidentally, just like quick question. <laughs> no, no. I mean, they should Google should sue them. I mean, they pretty much just <laughs> completely plagiarize their, their platform. <laughs> 
regards. Um, are you guys seeing the? Actually, the... if you want, I will tell yeah. you. Yeah. Google's, Google's business model has been to basically outsource this work to corporations because it they they basically maintain Google Hangout with great loss. So oh. now by by dropping Google Hangout, these other companies and there's quite a few of them can basically offer what Google Hangout did for a fee. And then you can basically uh, connect your feed to Google Live and still have it on YouTube. So basically it's a way of outsourcing. Plus, uh, they just wanna keep their very serious corporate clients. So they're right. offering the Google Hangout as it was free before for, for a much higher fee to their G Suite customers. Uh. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So I think they're okay if, even if some of these people are copying or in getting inspired by some aspects of Google Hangouts. Great. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I was I was a little shocked at how similar the applications were, uh, but I'm 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 happy because you know this makes it easy to navigate regardless. Oh, one um, more. I, I have I have a question. Sure. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's um, in the subtitle you put a dialectics and cybernetics. Yes. And I was asking if we could. Uh, yeah, you will do. I think that if we could connect this dialectics and cybernetics to this um, philosophy and anti-philosophy, I, well, um, I will. I will be yeah. doing that in due course because uh, okay. one of the one of sure. the things that so so uh, dialectics on the side of the CAE and the CCRU on the side of cybernetics will be speaking. I mean, in this introductory session, in a, in in a, in a kind of like overarching way. But now that you mention it, I will be. Uh, careful to draw the connection to philosophy and anti-philosophy as we understand it, because I think that's a, that's an interesting nexus. Also, I should say one thing before we jump in. Um, I'm hosting a, a fresh graduate student uh, from UCLA today who uh, is going to be arriving any, like in an hour or something. So I just need to open the door when this happens. It'll take a minute or something. Uh, if, if they arrive, they might arrive later. So uh, just, just forgive me for that. Um, just, I got to open the door for them, but it should be fine. So everybody's looking at the um, at the slideshow. Yes. 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 We can see it. Okay. And yes. can, can you see it when I when I change the slides as well? Yes. Great. Uh, for whatever. Hold on. Let me just make sure I, because uh, the the sidebar where everybody is sort of. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. Um, I just need a second to figure out how to make the, all right, yeah, sure. there we go. Great, 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 great. Okay, great. So for the, the first thing, as, as we all know, this is an attempt to think together. Uh, two of the most interesting think tanks which emerged in 20th century philosophy, the, the thinkers associated first with, uh, uh, there's like a bunch of typos in this in this paragraph, but whatever. So the the Cahiers pour l'analyse, which is closely associated to this research group, which was called Le Cercle d'Epistemologie, and which ran in France from roughly 1966 to 1969, right? So the the Cahiers pour l'analyse really is the the journal that was produced by this research group called Le Cercle the epistemology, and just forgive me for those typos because I, I, I changed this like right before. <laughs> um, and, and then the second, of course, is the Cybernetic Research Culture Unit, which emerged from the University of Warwick in England, and whose production spanned roughly between the years 1995 and 2003. And again, to reiterate, the central thesis that I want to put forward here is really that these groups, um, it's not just to focus on these groups in themselves and the influence that they had, but that the pairing concentrates in the contemporary context an iteration of this perennial tension between rationalism and empiricism, which has animated philosophical history since its inception, since Parmenides and Heraclitus. And so we are still there. And the same questions haunt us. And these two research groups, in a way, bring forth the same questions that Hermenides and Heraclitus were, were, were waging in the contemporary context. So it's always refreshing to try to see how it is that philosophy goes through these motions uh, as these kinds of transcendental structures, right? And if you want to think of philosophy transcendentally, like Laurel does, for example, right? To try to have a theory of philosophy, then 
this kind of oscillation is as, as, as solid as one can get. It's really a historical invariant that sprawls across all the epochs of philosophical history. And I'll have more to say about just exactly what I mean uh, by, you know, these, what exactly becomes reiterated. So I will, in what follows, I'll be seeking to clarify this thesis and introduce the two vectors and tr try to explain it in terms precisely of this iterative historical pendular movement between rationalism and empiricism and how it ramifies, uh, you know, how it has ramifications for our, how we understand philosophy, not just in the contemporary context, but as a whole. So that's the other thing that I think uh, is interesting about this pairing or this course is that as much as we focus on these two groups, we can sort of metonymically uh, understand something quite essential about the nature of philosophy as a whole. And by doing so, uh, you can get a feel for where philosophy could be going in the future as well. So I will be also trying to draw a sense of how what happens after the CCRU and the CAE can be understood also as analogous to what happened in response or what happens generally in response to the tensions between rationalism and empiricism, which is precisely to try to find a, a middle ground or a way out of both. Spoiler alerts, Kant. And there's a reason why Kant has become popular again today, isn't it? Um, so the first thing to say, the KS and the CCRU in the broadest possible sense again. So I propose to, first of all, read the project elaborated in the CAE as an attempt to rekindle the valences of, dialectical of the dialectical materialist method associated with, rational with the rationalist legacy in the wake of new advances in the social and formal sciences. And this uh, attempt to rekindle dialectical materialism is formulated in response, as I mentioned earlier, to, on the one hand, this kind of post-Heideggerian dominance of phenomenology and existentialism and voluntarism in the political domain, which had become prescient in France in the 40s and 50s, above all emblemized by the thinking of Sartre. Uh, one of the things that we will be reading for the next session when we start reading the Cahier, uh, you'll, you'll note um, Peter Hallward in the introduction, who traces uh, the, in more detail the history of, of the Cahiers, and we'll of course be talking about that as well next, next week in more detail. But one of the things that he mentions is that in the 40s and 50s, really Sartre's influence had become, had reached a kind of dead end, which was this conception, the Sartrean conception of the free self-determining subject, the abyss of freedom from which the act sprawls, and in relation to which the concept of structure was considered to be derivative, had become a uh, defanged or had become a stale and it, it became impossible one of the reasons why the the reinterrogation of dialectical materialism in a structuralist register becomes necessary is precisely because this kind of voluntarism that the sartrean picture leads to um, had become completely inefficient in creating new modes of collectivization. So this is what, this is really the kind of deadlock in which French philosophy sort of has to sh shuffle the board once again and pick itself up. And in particular, as I mentioned, it, it did so, it, it tried to do, so, do this by attending to structuralist approaches that had become prescient and emergent in the fields of linguistics and psychoanalysis. Uh, and this, this appropriation of structuralism was of course very much, I mean, of course it has its roots in Lévi-Strauss, a structural anthropology, but it becomes a, a, a sort of dominant mode or form of thinking. We'll, we'll talk more about what exactly structuralism means uh, in this kind of general sense, but it becomes in this, in the project of the Cahier reflected above all in the schools and the works of Althusser and Lacan and their students and followers. So we will be seeing how this structuralist uh, promise becomes the lever, methodological, methodological lever, to reinterrogate or rekindle the possibility of a dialectical materials theory of, subject, of subjectivity and therefore of politics, therefore of politics. On the other hand, I propose to read the CCRE as a higher to the empiricist tradition in, in, in what is an attempt to defy the valences of the dialectical method. So yes, the CCRU as in general, in, you know, in, empiricists, also consider themselves to be in, in, in direct tension with the dialectic. And it does so by looking at a different possibility for formalization or formal, uh, let's say, uh, methodological instruction. 
So rather than looking at structuralist approaches in, in linguistic or psychoanalysis or in the social sciences as it had become, uh, as becomes predominant in the Cahiers, these, the thinkers of the CCRU look at cybernetic theory. And in particular, as it is informed by the kind of uh, work that you see in the machinic ontology of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, which I'm pretty sure, uh, well, I'm not sure, but which is largely indebted to the work of Gilbert Simondon, for example, uh, earlier in the century, but which also tries to not only circumscribe itself to developments in the sciences proper, but which tries to forge a new kind of materialist metaphysics and what they call hyperstitional practice, and we'll talk more about this, and by drawing from all kinds of uh, experimental practices in the arts, um, everything from electronic music to uh, you know different forms of uh, let's say aberrant literature that you know from from Lovecraftian mythology, Gothic you know myth mythology to Gibsonian cyberpunk, and so it becomes this extraordinary place of 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 uh, intellectual production and cultural production. And the CCRU similarly conceives of itself as responding to what had become a prevailing mode of discourse, not just in the academy, but in the kind of intellectual ambience promoted by philosophers and theorists, which was the kind of crass historicist relativism that was popularized, especially in cultural studies in comparative literature and, and, and places as such, well, in, in, in England, mostly in cultural studies, but which of course peddled similarly to the kind of like post-Heideggerian uh, trajectories in, in France and in post-war France had like leaked into the humanities, this kind of general relativism and textualist hermeneutics. And one of the things we'll see is that at one of the very first texts in the CCRU writings collection addresses itself directly as a kind of, you know, challenge to this hegemonic academic discourse that had become prevalent at the time. And, you know, the writers of the CCRU collective express a, a blatant disgust at cultural studies. <laughs> and they say, you know, we just, there's a wonderful line that they write, which is something like, um, you know, middle class white people speaking on behalf of the oppressed is not our jam or something like that. You know? uh, and and, and they, they thought that popular forms of, of cultural production that were largely neglect, neglected and pushed apart from the ivory towers of the academy were every bit as ripe. And that was where the true um, popular like and, and, and emancipatory movements were occurring, not in this like lofty discourse of the academy, but actually in the underground clubs and in the, you know, with the artists and, you know, and, and popular pop literature and, you know, so on and so forth. So in this regard, th and, and this is to answer the question about uh, anti-philosophy and philosophy, if the Cahier on the one hand does try to sort of rekindle dialectical materialist philosophy after Lacan, after the Lacanian challenge and after the derail of metaphysics, the CCRU is trying to not reconstitute philosophy, but actually position itself against both on the one hand, this kind of crass end of metaphysics relativist tenor that had become you know, predominant in the post-war era and especially in the English speaking world with the, with the growth of cultural studies and all these other fields. But also it, it, it presumes to be a kind of more ambitiously still, a very violent anti-philosophical discourse that in the spirit of Nietzsche, Bataille, and others, would wage war against the very foundations of philosophy. Uh, not just this kind of reduced, relativistic, uh, mournful, pathetic form that it had obtained uh, in, in, in the fields that I mentioned. So that's like the, the, the basic construal of the, two, of the two vectors. Nevertheless, in spite of these like diametrical uh, divergences, we can see that they are looking to address a, a set of common problems, right? And these are really the questions that we will be considering as weaving the two think tanks together. First, um, you know, that, that one question. Absolutely, yeah. Um, sorry, um, regarding the, um, the slide before, uh, where you said, okay, the CCIU position sure. themselves against this historicist relativism and theory and cultural studies and yes. philosophy. And 
I ask myself, um, why? Um, what? Why did? Why didn't they just choose sides? Maybe it's uh, that they think, okay, they both share too much. I, I would like to understand uh, what they uh, reject in, on, at both sides. Right. That. Yeah. So. So. Of course, we'll get into that as we as as we delve deeper into into the materials. But 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 to give you a feel for what's at stake here, this goes really back to this whole Parmenides and Heraclitus question. If you think about the origins of philosophy in its Platonic and Socratic form, one of the things that people tend to forget is that Heraclitus was considered to be on the side of the sophists, right? So Heraclitus is both, you know the 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 harbinger the originator of the empiricist legacy but in its origins it was actually sharply separated from philosophy which was rather understood on the model of the parmenidean dialectical model and one of the things that the ccru does or takes issue with is precisely the dialectic so we will see how this sort of brings back or rekindles uh from the grave very very uh familiar tropes that you get already, for example, in Nietzsche about the limits of the dialectical method and the limits of the classical pretensions of philosophy. Nevertheless, I think that there is a kind of you want to have your cake and eat it thing, which is generally the case with anti-philosophy. In other words, one of the things that Badiou, I think, is correct in diagnosing is that anti-philosophy, even though it positions itself against philosophy, it nevertheless belongs to the philosophical tradition. So when somebody like Nick Land or the thinkers of the CCRU peddle something like, uh, you know, a post-philosophical or anti-philosophical materialism, or when they pit cybernetics against philosophy as a whole, you have to think to yourself, well, you know, is this just rhetorical flourish? Is this just sort of taking a stand? Or is this, uh, you know, just, a different kind of philosophy, really, you know, it, which, which I think it is at the end of the day. I mean, when, if you're talking about materialism, it is at the end of the day, a philosophical position that you are articulating, regardless of the disavowed sort of uh, hatred, right, of philosophy that you might want to have. Um, hold on. I have to actually to, in, in order to keep, tr I have to keep track of the uh, chat window uh, as well. But the part of the problem is that it, it, it goes over the slideshow as I see it. I don't know if you see it as well right now, what I'm seeing, uh, but just let me see. Risk of criticizes, just to make sure Vincent de Combe is cut up in having that prioritizing. Yes. Oh yeah, well, one thing about, just to say about, um, about the, the Baduian concept of anti-philosophy, which is of course, uh, which I'm, I'm running with here. The, the way Badiou, for those of you who are not familiar with this concept, I, I guess I should just like introduce it, is that um, for Badiou, essentially anti-philosophy positions the act or, 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 or the act of the, of the subject against the category of truth. So truth, of course, the classical sort of philosophical category, which, which denotes universality and variance and so on. Um, philosophy, the discourse, which aims to uh, you know, forge a concept of truth. And every now and then in the history of philosophy comes the anti-philosopher to poop all over the party and basically say, <laughs> you know, um, well, truth is impossible and so on and so forth. And, and, and they, they produce a challenge to philosophy generally in the name of a kind of practical uh, rather than theoretical imperative. So there's a kind of close connection between anti-philosophy and practicism understood as and a, a sort of act or a doing, a kind of you know practice that cannot be reincorporated into the registers of philosophical uh, adjudication. So this is a this is a really really um, interesting like concept that helps but you periodize philosophy in different ways. Um, and I think uh, Ikin uh, just just wrote some something very interesting there, which is uh, how. He describes it in, in, in the book Logics of World, but uh, he's actually devoted a series of seminars to the great anti-philosophers of uh, modernity with Malebranche, uh, you know, Lacan, Nietzsche, and so on and so forth. So, so I, I, and, you know, these are getting published now. I think the Malebranche is supposed to come out if it hasn't already. So that's already available. The one on Lacan is out. 
And I'm pretty sure the ones on Nietzsche are going to come out. Also, the one on Plato is about to come out, but regardless. So that's all in our, uh, oh, in Kierkegaard, of course, as well. So anyway, so uh, j j just to get back to the, uh, to the, um, to the slideshow. So, so the, the set of common questions that bind both of these think tanks together, and we'll return to some of these concerns about just like exactly where this, all of this fits into the philosophy and to philosophy spectrum. But um, first question is how to think of a notion of materiality freed from ideological or idealistic overtones. This is, as you know, those of you who are familiar with the work of Althusser, one of the important questions that he and his group are raising time and time again in the cahier is, how to reconstitute the concept of science and the distinction between science and ideology, which was dear to Marx, in the wake of the critique of scientificity and philosophy that and of metaphysics that had become popular since Heidegger in the 20th century. So uh, Althusser is very much looking at psychoanal uh, structural psychoanalysis for pointers, for, for finding a way out of this debt, historicist relativist deadlock generated by the postmodern and Heideggerian sort of a saga. Second, how to think of a concept of subjectivity freed from pious humanism, right? So as I mentioned, in the case of the Cahiers, for example, um, Sartrean voluntarism had become a predominant mode of, 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 of thinking and it, it had led practical political thought to a kind of philosophical deadlock. And how to free um, philosophy and our conceptions of the subject and of activity from this kind of residual voluntarist humanism. Um, so, you know, th these two questions, the one of the question of the subject on the one hand and the question of politics and agency, which, which are the, the, the two questions that I line up here are obviously interwoven. Um, so, you know, one of the things we have to always think about is how it is that both the Cahiers and the CCRU are trying to simultaneously reconstitute the concept of the subject and the concept of being outside of regulated forms of philosophical discourse and also ideological uh, overtones or overdeterminations. How to, is it possible to do this, to resist the death of metaphysics and the death of philosophy? Finally, how to, how to escape positively the patheticism or ambivalence of postmodern cynicism and critical irony after the Heideggerian critique of metaphysics and the critique of all universalist projects. So that's, of course, the, the, the big umbrella, which sprawls across both projects in a way, because the CCRU, even though it's not situated in the immediate consequence of the, like, like in the French uh, post-war context of the effects of phenomenology and existentialism with Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, and so on, Nevertheless, what I mentioned before, which is the, the, the increasing influence of um, Heideggerian thought and postmodernity and deconstruction and, 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 and you know, uh, literary criticism in the, in the humanities, had become extraordinarily uh, oppressive or, or, or you know, constrictive, uh, according to the people in the CCRU. And so both are trying to find a way out of this deadlock. And as we shall see, what results out of this is two divergent versions of materialism, two you know, di divergent conceptions of what means uh, what the subject is, and different formal means and methods to achieve the liberations of our accounts of being and subjectivity. And it is in, the, in this divergence that we see the reiteration of the choice between rationalism and empiricism that I mentioned before, in what I can, we can call, I guess, a kind of neo-modern sequence like neo-modernity, where we're, we're once again in this kind of sequence and repeating itself. Let me stop there for one second just to, to, to check the chat. A anybody has any questions or comments, please jump in. Lacan didn't in invent the term. Yeah. There's an, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, like Lacan didn't invent the term. Uh, and in fact, there are times where he says, Lacan, I'm a philosopher, you know, screw this. Uh, and there's other times where he says, uh, Adrian Johnson's very good with, with this stuff, incidentally. Um, I have yeah. another question about um, the, uh, the, um, the slide says, it's about, it's about liberation of our concepts, or, or maybe the thing itself of um, being and subjectivity in yes. both Cahier and CCIU. And yes. if this, uh, maybe that's just, okay, maybe that's just an, a word association, but is this that, they, that there is some kind of um, inherent emancipatory rector in both 
or in the Kasher and in the CCIU. And the question is just, okay, what is to be emancipa emancipated? Exactly. Like li liberation on, on the side of the theory is uh, coupled to, okay, to emancipation in some way. No, exactly. And, and actually, so this is why the question of the subject is indissociable from the question of politics or emancipation or, or liberation or practice in general, right? Because if, especially if you're trying to simultaneously defy anthropo, you know, kind of anthropomorphic conception of the subject or idealism or a kind of, you know, overlaying humanism in your conception of the subject, if you're trying to precisely decant the concept of the subject from these um, spooks, you're going to have to explain very clearly what kind of agency constitutes itself, especially when you speak about collective agency or something like an emancipatory process or a political process. What does this mean once you've sort of destroyed the kernel of the will or the kernel of, uh, you know, phenomenological experience that, that characterizes these earlier humanist accounts of subjectivity. And what we will see is precisely that both proponents in the CAE and the CCRU produce radical, radically different conceptions of the subject. And in this difference, you can see very, very perennial tensions reemerge with regards to, for example, what kind of politics one can emerge, uh, one can expect from each of these vectors. And lo and behold, uh, you know, the distinction today, for example, between left and right accelerationism is intimately woven into this divergence, this conceptual and theoretical divergence. We're not ready for that yet, of course. We, we have to go through the motions of understanding just exactly what these people think the subject is, how they elaborate it. And from there, we can have a more robust conception of what they think let's say emancipation can be or politics can be or cannot be in any case, right? Um, the CCRU are famous for, as, you know, as, as land progressively sunk into this spiral of, not cynicism, I would call it, but this kind of, uh, you know, trying to have no residual truck with any form of humanism or vitalism whatsoever or voluntarism. The question of whether even the, the term politics can, can apply becomes precarious and urgent. So that's another thing we're going to be interrogating, in fact, which is within the horizon that the CCRU sets out for us and within their conception of subjectivity, is there really any room for anything like collective organization, action, emancipation, or is it not really a deadlock? Um, Cool. There's there's an interesting discussion still going on Lacan and anti philosophy in the in, in the chat room, but um, let's let's move forward because I have quite a bit to go through. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, that's not changing. There we go. And so one of the things I was saying is that you know this this kind of pairing reveals a historic. It's not just curious, but it reveals a historical invariance or a kind of structural invariance in the history of philosophy, and that this can shed light on what we can expect from philosophy or demand philosophy do in the future. So we will be looking at a variety of think tanks that and, 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 and vectors of thought, orientations of thought that, that occur from these two uh, you know, uh, schools or whatever you want to call them. And I mentioned a few naturalist metaphysics, speculative realism, neo-rationalism, accelerationism, post-humanism and inhumanism, theory fiction, xenofeminism. So there's quite a lot there, and uh, uh, and you know we don't have time to, to 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 be extremely devoted to any one of these in, in in much detail. So a lot of these topics will be overlapping and just emerging in as part of a, of, a, of a wider conversation that we'll have. Um, and uh, I'm trying to keep track at the same time of the chat window. Sorry to make sure that nobody. If anybody has a question, just just try because it's kind of uh, difficult for me to keep going back and forth and then like un. On, uh, on Google, on, like not, not making it cover my screen, basically. <laughs> okay, so uh, a few words on the structure of the course. So there's general, there's two parts. First part really encompasses weeks uh, two to five, and this is an examination of the primary sources. So we will be reading the major text from the two-volume collection of the Calle, edited by Peter Hallward, titled Form and Concept. Uh, which includes recent commentary by the authors that participated uh, in the Kaya in, in a kind of like retrospective assessment. And we will be reading from, of course, the collected writings of the CCRU, uh, which 
from 1997 and 2003. The CCRU again has this kind of extraordinarily uh, erratic production that sprawls way beyond uh, textual production. So there's you know all, all forms of visual and auditory art that would be cool to to engage with, but um, we will be focusing on the collected writings. I mean, we just don't have that much time. So, and, and specifically the 1997 to 2003 collection, collected writings, there's quite a bit that, as you know, that occurs after in the blogosphere that uh, is very difficult to track and to trace and to, and, and, and to piece together in a coherent fashion. And a more comprehensive course just devoted to the CCRU would take a look at that, but we will just be uh, concerned with the canon as it were. Then in part two, which encompasses weeks uh, six to eight, we will be engaging in an examination of the ramifications and the legacy of these two think tanks. So we will be undertaking a survey of the most influential vectors of thought that were directly inspired by these two think tanks and which respond to the frictions between them constructively and, and critically, including the thought, the orientations of thought that I mentioned, like new process naturalist metaphysics, like Manuel de Landa, speculative realism, Kenton Meassou, Neo-rationalism, Ray Brassier, uh, accelerationism, and both his left and rightist forms, so Nick Stern, Second Williams, and the Sith Lord himself, Nick Land, and uh, Zeno the, the 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 recent Xenofeminist uh, project, which is concentrated in the Laboria Cubonics uh, uh, think tank or collective. So, in, in in what follows, I want to just uh, draw this kind of coarse genealogy, philosophical genealogy, broader genealogy. Which we can, um, which can help us situate the this course in a, in, a, in a wider constellation of philosophical problems. Okay. So th three conceptual diets. Those who have taken seminars with me before will will find these three rather familiar. Uh, they animate much of my work. So the first one is the diet between materialism and idealism, and this is a diet which concerns the metaphysical question about whether what is set to be is mind independent, mind dependent, or mind independent, right? So uh, I should put it the other way around, just to for 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 coherence. But mind dependency, if what is if what there is is mind dependent, that's idealism. If what there is is mind independent, that's classically considered either realism or materialism, right? So materialists endorse the existence of a mind independent reality, whereas idealists, at least in their absolute form, say that reality is in some sense mind dependent. And this is a metaphysical question or determination. The second diet, empiricism and rationalism, concerns the epistemological question about how being is known or disclosed through different abilities or capacities, right? So empiricism classically endorses the thesis according to which that which is knowable or known is disclosed primarily, first and foremost, through sensory intuition. Whereas rationalists claim, on the other hand, that there is a kind of knowledge which is not sensorially or I'm sorry like uh, derived from the senses but can be arrived to inferentially through the exercise of pure reason or reason itself so the classical example of course here would be something like Descartes right Descartes thinks that the foundations of knowledge are achieved in a kind of re retrieval of our innate no ideas that you obtain from the armchair through a procedure that he calls radical doubt on the other hand you have somebody like Locke, who is the paradigmatic modern um, empiricist who claims, no, there are no innate ideas. All knowledge begins in the sensible and from the sensible, right? Simple impressions yield simple ideas, but everything bottoms in impressions and the effect of the senses on the body. And finally, there's this third uh, uh, dyad, which is Parmenidianism and Heraclitianism. And this is, again, a metaphysical determination or contrast, but this concerns the distinction of whether being is said to be prior to becoming or whether becoming is prior to being. So classically, Parmen Parmenides claims, as you know, that being is one, and by one he means it, is, it, 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 it has the properties of unity, it is unchanging, it persists in time, it is not subject, in other words, to the flux of the sensible. Whereas on the other hand, Heraclitians claim that you can never step into the same river twice, that matter, reality is flux and change. It's chaos in the last instance. And that their instability, uh, I'm sorry, that, that stability, unity, uh, permanence is 
the exception that in fact materiality is constituted and being is constituted as becoming. Um, so the priority of being is of course a Parmenidean um, gesture, the, par the priority of becoming is, a pr is the Heraclitean gesture. Uh, are these three diets somewhat clear? I'm slightly Russian, but uh, you know, hope hopefully this is not too uh, convoluted. Any questions? Let me ch check the chat just in case somebody's not very chatty. <laughs> Let's see. I think oh, you did an excellent job of uh, carving this diet, by the way. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have I have another question. Sure. And uh, concerning empiricism and rationalism. Yes. And um, couldn't one say that basically that uh, when you say, okay, you're an empiricist and you claim that there is no knowledge that is uh, not uh, derived from the sense or that um, um, I, I asked myself if basically empiricism in its most radical way actually challenges the any notion of rationality or reason itself that it says okay well reason rationality is is, is a product of something else absolutely and Eric one of the I mean you 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 sort of uh, 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 spoiled the be spilled the beans here but one of the things that we're going to see is that as empiricism progresses or develops, and especially in the CCRU, it's no longer an empiricism that can be said to simply be uh, dependent on the primacy of the aesthetic, for example, on aesthetic receptivity. But just like, like it challenges thinking or rationality as a whole, it also challenges the conception of uh, aesthetic recept receptivity or sensation. So it's a kind of radical empiricism decanted from any kind of support in the human faculties. That is to say sensibility and the understanding or the intellect. So we'll see actually how the CCRU, the way that they promote this kind of radical anti, uh, you know, philosophy or, or, or materialism is precisely by voiding the kind of residual vitalism and aestheticism from empiricism, right? Uh, and, and, and they do so by producing, by basically reducing empiricism to a kind of functional pragmatism or what, what, what is really called a practicism. Uh, uh, Nick Land calls it machinic practice, machinic practicism. And we'll see what this means in more precise detail later, but, but, but you're very much uh, in tune, yeah. Any other comments or, or, or concerns or anything? No? All right. Well, so, uh, I, I wanted to comment. Um, I I uh, was reminded uh, when you talked about the, um, let's say, critiquing uh, the subjectivity that happened. Let's say this critique that happened of subjectivity. Federico, Federico, you uh, you, you went out there. I yeah. remember that there is this sort of memory of someone who went to Birch. Uh, are we? I'm. 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 I'm not hearing Federico. Are you guys hearing Federico? No. I, no. No. Uh, no. Uh, can no, you hear I me? Think, I, think, I think his. Sig yes. I think his signal. Maybe turn the video off and ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm you, gonna can, try that. Federico, yeah. can you can can you repeat your your comment, please? From oh the, yeah. From the, uh, the, um, regarding the 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 say the the undermining that uh, the CCRU made about subjectivity. Yes. Uh, um, I remember that there's this memory of someone who went to virtual futures in 94 uh, and commented, uh, let's say this discussion that went between uh, the land and uh, I think it was Stellark, that they were actually oh. criticizing this, uh, this stratifying, this, this mad distratification that land did uh, about subjectivity and uh, the land was criticizing land's uh, distratification, telling him that uh, basically this, this would be um, a, re a reinforcing of, uh, you know, the, the things that he was trying to distratify, you know, that eventually that was what happened to him personally, this uh, re-stratification of what he was trying to radically uh, distratify, no? Like, no, that's really interesting. Yeah, I don't know about this conversation, but I would be very much interested in, in, uh, in hearing more about it. But yeah, I think one, and I think uh, Ray Brassi has a very similar critique, which is, that there's only so much you can throw away before you end up back in 
sort of a kind of dogmatic metaphysical framework, right? That's actually the, the kernel of my own critique of, of Nick, which I develop in a chapter in my, well, in, as part of a chapter in a book, which traces this kind of trajectory. But I, I, I agree with Delanda there, um, that there is a kind of deadlock that you obtain with practicism at the end of the tunnel. Now, to be fair, one of the things that we're going to be looking at as well is the limits of what these both both of these trajectories propose. So just like the CCRU's practices model of subjectivity and agency has a kind of limit point or deadlock or faces a problem, so does the uh, model of subjectivity that you get from the people in the Cahiers meet a, a whole roster of familiar problems, right? And what's interesting is that both problems make the other camp go oh, you see, you've relapsed into some kind of pious humanist trope here, right? So the CCRU relapses predictably to a kind of dogmatic metaphysical practicism that, that, that just is simply completely you know, arbitrary and dogmatic. And the Cahiers ends up producing this concept of subjectivity as the cut or break or you know, seizure of the situation, predigmatically induced sort of event, which is a kind of rekindled voluntarism hiding underneath the ranks because you need subjectivation to sort of inscribe itself in the structure in a way that is somehow anomalous or illegal or something like that. And at that point, you have the residual Sartrean, the influence of Sartre, the, the ghosts of Sartre reemerge in the shadow of the structuralist legacy. And I think that's a very interesting thing, how if you look at both of these trajectories, their ultimate failures are analogous to the failures of the classical rationalist and empiricists. In other words, you know, the, the problems that modern empiricism faced and the problems that uh, you know, modern rationalism faced are the same problems that these people face now. And the reason why I think Kant has become popular and the reason why much of what we call neo-rationalism today begins precisely by a reconsideration of the Kantian and German idealist legacy more broadly in the pursuit of what of a transcendental materialism or dialectical materialism is precisely because it is with Kant that you get an attempt at a resolution from these two camps. What both I, I suppose this is something I should have said, or or but but now it's crystallized after your comment, is that one thing that's absolutely crucial that marks the, the common ground of both the Cahiers and the CCRU is that both are very strongly or claim to be very strongly post-Kantian registers of expression, right? Both have no truck with representation, both have no truck with epistemology proper. They, they, you know, they, they, they really don't care about that at all. Um, but there's a price to be paid for that, right? And, and we'll see precisely what the price is to be paid. I think somebody wrote something. It would be interesting to you. Yeah, uh, me too. So Federico, if you can later send us the source, that would be lovely. Um, I, one question. Um, you said that both run into the same problems, basically, and I, uh, I ask, would they, uh, would these um, individual think tanks um, or collectives um, subscribe to, okay, we share a common problem, or is the question of, okay, like uh, if you say, okay, the, uh, the CCIU runs back into the dogmatic metaphysics, and from their point of view, they wouldn't, maybe they, they wouldn't say that. Like that's, that's maybe my, my question. Like, do they all share a universal framework, basically? Uh, uh, well, does it look from? Is it like a perspectivism they, that's uh, uh, dependent upon which stance you have? You perceive different problems. Right. So, so I, I mean, um, so there's two parts to this question, really. One is, of course, each of these think tanks includes a variety of thinkers within it. So it's, it's, it, it can be overly violent, especially in the case of the Cahiers where, you know, it, was, it, it went on for 10 volumes and, 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 you know, everybody from Foucault to Derrida published there. So it would be exceedingly crass to say that everybody just says the same thing at the end of the day. But um, there is a, a kind of uh, common ground that the, the members of the Cahiers um, and, and especially after Badiou's arrival in the last two years, do share. And of course, all of them, and, it does, and, and so in the case of the CCRU, it's more complicated, of course, because they write as a collective and not as a separate, a separate authors, right? And that's part of their, their whole idea of trying to destabilize the notion of authorship and individual subjectivation 
and trying to, you know, and so on. But um, with regards to the question of um, whether they would admit to these, to this, uh, to this claim, which is that, you know, they fall into familiar tropes or troubles that, that, that plagued, you know, classical empiricist and rationalist philosophy before them, absolutely they would have something to say uh, back, right? I mean, of course, no philosopher ever just goes and hears you're wrong and just stays quiet and, and changes their mind. They all have uh, an interesting and intricate defenses, which is why we still have a kind of debate going on between Baduans and Deleuzeans and, you know, Nick Land and Reza and, and so on and so forth. So there is a debate, of course. Uh, I What I offer to you is that there is a clear issue nevertheless that is clearly identifiable in, in the rationalist trajectory emblemized in the Cahiers and, and the kind of concept of subjectivity that they draw from again a kind of structural conception of the subject uh, and then on the other hand the cybernetic model from the CCRU which leads to a kind of practicism now both have a set of, of problems that one has to answer and whether we have arrived in the, you know, after their original formulation to satisfactory answers to that question. So that will be part of what we will be examining as we read these texts and we explore these questions. Okay. Is, does that, is that helpful? For, for that, the that, that is okay. Thanks. Great. I think great. we'll come back to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, of course, this is just like, this is just like the hors de oeuvre, or however you pronounce that French pretentious word. <laughs> uh, so, one more, uh, just this is by way of illustration, um, to illustrate this kind of uh, iteration across the epochs of philosophy of this dialectic between rationalism and empiricism, beginning with the, the founding fathers. So with Parmenides, you have your, your classical rationalist philosopher, according to which being is disclosed to thinking, to pure thinking in the idea or as the idea, and it is subtracted from the flux of sensory appearances. Being is one, is permanent, Heraclitus, the par paradigmatic empiricist, claims that being is the flux of sensation, the ceaseless coming into being and out of being, which the idea cannot fail to apprehend. Because, you know, the moment that you identify something as whatever it is, this river, even ostensibly, it's already become something different. So the idea can never match the, ma the, the thing itself, the, ma the, mater the process of material becoming, right? Which is what is presented directly to the senses rather than to thinking. In the modern legacy, I already mentioned this, this, this classical iteration. So Descartes, for Descartes, who is the pragmatic like rationalist, modern rationalist, innate ideas are discovered inferentially while sensation is mute. Primary properties are known by mathematical representings and they do not resemble sensory appearances. So as you know, uh, with Descartes, you already have the, 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 the basic distinction between physical representings, uh, rep sorry, uh, representings and mental representatives. So what you have is a kind of algebraic geometrical language which enables you to know of physical matter through these kinds of second order discursive representations which are mathematical forma, formula, right? So the sensible is only known that material, the material world is only known secondarily through these abstract representings which are fundamentally abstract in nature. They're ideal structures. They're mathematical algebraic formula. Um, so the sensory can only be apprehended or known derivatively through the idea, right? Whereas on the contrast, Locke and Hume, the empiricists claim that ideas are derived from sensory impressions directly. You have a kind of direct causal access or rather causal efficacy that goes from having or undertaking a sensory impression to having an idea of that impression. This is what classically uh, Wilfred Sellers calls the myth of the given, right? The myth of the given is the idea that the structure of the world imprints itself on the mind as a seal does on wax, right? You go from having a sensation of P to knowing that P is P uh, or A is A or whatever. So, in the contemporary context, or I should say, well, 20th century context, right, we can find, once again, this kind of reiteration in, for example, the distinction in the attempt to forge a new thinking of science uh, in the wake of evolutionary biology, but also, you know, in the wake of mathematical physics and, and trying to assess its legacy. 
in, for example, the, the division between Bachelard and Bergson, right, who, who after all had their fair share of tussles, like in, in, in print, not tussles, but, you know, di divergences. So with Bachelard, you, of course, have your classical rationalist thinker, to whom the Cahiers is largely indebted as far as philosophy of science is concerned. Bachelard claims or argues that science thinks being as purely relational. In other words, that science thinks not of essences that are eternal within a particular discursive framework, but thinks of relationships between elements in a particular theoretical framework. And that one has to think of science or the history of science as a series of formal breakthroughs in relational, in, in how you set up a system of relations, which is progressive and historical, you know, and, 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 and historically bound to a specific practical interest, to specific distorting factors. And you can see just by reading this description, which is very crass, I know, but it's, it, it we'll have to do, how this is already very much in the spirit of a structuralist conception of materiality, right? A relational, fundamentally relational conception of materiality in which rather than thinking about what something is in terms of a set of internal properties or essential properties or qualitative properties or something like that, you think of the identity of something in terms of how it relates or is distinguished from other elements in a node or network of relations or a system of relations, right? But this system of relations is purely abstract. It's a formal ideography. It's part of a scientific theory. On the other hand, on the flip side of this is, of course, you have Bergson, the vitalist, right? The Elan Vital, in which as you know, for in, uh, he, when he describes the movement of what he calls creative evolution, sensibility presents directly to thinking the qualitative and intensive nature of being as pure duration. So for, for Bergson, um, you know, the, the, the fabric of conceptualization of the intellect is nothing but a distorting sieve in relation to the endowments of the sensible. The sensible presents pure duration that is becoming directly to thinking. Right, which is why Bergson, which is why Bergson uh, short circuits the distinction between representation and the thing in itself, or, or you know, the appearance and reality, so as to identify appearances with the things themselves. In other words, what presents itself directly to the sensible, to your sensory experience, is the thing in its, in itself. Material appearances are the things. Uh, which is why also, incidentally, uh, Bergson is not only an empiricist, but obviously on this, a Heraclitean, right? Because he prioritizes the flux of sens sens sensibility, i.e. duration, what he calls pure duration, over uh, you know, sedentary, discreetly individuated bodies in space and time. Uh, but doesn't uh, you know, that disequilibrium... The, the flux uh, in La Durée, doesn't it also uh, quell and form a kind of, uh, uh, of equilibrium? So the flux is always settling. And uh, because my, my reading of Bergson is that there is something, this, this rift where, you know, will comes into play. Bergson right. is trying to sort of save free will despite it's occluded from our, our epistemic access through duration, through movement, through this, this flux, which is then quelled and thus out of reach. So sort of this ideal beacon. Do you think that's something new that's sort of introduced? Not maybe solely in Bergson, but this, this notion of will, at what point do you think uh, that, that introduces itself? I, 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 um, I think he wants that because part of the problem that he faces, especially when he gets into this deep discussion in, in creative evolution, I mean, so there's two parts of it, of course. Bergson is no so so on the one hand just because he accepts the primacy of pure of, of 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 the sensory and pure becoming and duration it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a theory of individuation he does but it's a very weak one right how is it that the that, that the world of pure duration eventually yield the discrete bodies that populate the natural world the discrete forms of space and time blah 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 I mean he has this entire account this is exactly what matter and memory tries to do. But create, in creative evolution, he has a much more sort of like hectic and out of control project where he tries to tap this back to a bunch of other things. And one of the things that he wants to re, uh, leave room for is precisely what you're saying, freedom and the will, and how to inscribe this into this kind of naturalist metaphysical order. Um, and 
I, I, I don't know that Bergson, at least nothing that I have read has persuaded me to, into thinking that Bergson has anything close to a coherent account of how this taps into the metaphysics. In other words, it seems almost like a supplementary bit of the account, but I've never been quite able to figure out, maybe you can help me with this, but it's like I've never been able to figure out how the will presumably plays a role in the constitution of duration and how it, it, it presumably can affect how individuation takes place. I mean, because the, the, the workings of memory, right, and the contractions of memory which yield this discrete, you know, individuation for, for Bergson are not products of any kind of deliberative act. Um, they are, they're, 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 they're somatic, psychosomatic processes of a psychological nature, as he says, but they're not uh, a process that, are, that is subordinated to deliberative cognition in the sense of like conceptual inferential thinking, right? as far as I can tell. But then, I mean, to the extent that freedom requires something of that ilk, right? Something like deliberative cognition, something like, uh, you know, rational adjudication or whatever you want. It's not clear to me how that can work within the framework that Bergson has, has laid for us. And to, to be fair, I think this is a problem that afflicts Bergson as metaphysics and metaphysicians, including Deleuze, although Deleuze is a much more sophisticated account of uh, subjectivation, as far as I can tell. Uh, but yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with this qualm. Uh, I recently reviewed uh, David Lapujad's uh, book on Bergson, Powers of Time, and yeah. he, he, uh, he elaborates on what Bergson calls sympathy, which a lot of uh, a lot of uh, secondary commenters have dismissed. So I, I recommend this text uh, for a, a kind of a new reading on Bergson, uh, mostly through his his uh, his writing on. Uh, I mean, through through his all his whole oeuvre. Uh, however, that word is that pretentious word is also uh, pronounced. <laughs> I feel like it sounds like oval when people pronounce it. But it's not. <laughs> not um, but yeah I, I recommend this book uh, no excellent I mean th thank you uh, but j uh, one thing I should just say uh, so the question of whether there is actually a, 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 a reasonable role let's say for the will to be uh, you know placed in this framework that still does not um, the, the, that still doesn't affect the fact that he is an empiricist right I mean at the bottom we still have this kind of direct i mean the very beginning of, of of creative evolution makes makes this like absolutely unambiguous right that that you begin with the order of common sense and the order of common sense is it's wet not just to common speech or parlance but you describe things as they appear to you directly and directly that is to the sense to the senses right um so 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 in that regard there the that he is an empiricist, uh, even if there is a room for the will, remains, I think, uh, a, a fairly secure thesis. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess that's not terrible, but I have I have another question um, sure. re 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 regarding um, this cult cultural studies, historical relativism, post heideggerian phenomenology, and um, you now categorize the Cahier and the CCIU as rationalist and empiricist, but they both like what what we say okay postmodern theory cultural study all this clumped into one uh, one word where would you put this one on on this uh, in this bias between uh, rationalism and empiricism you mean uh, the 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 post heideggerian or the heideggerian tra trajectory yes yes and what uh, both uh, the cashier and the ccu uh, rallied against well i think i think that broadly well in in its original husserlian inception uh, I think that Husserl was trying to do something very similar to what Kant was trying to do. Uh, even though, I mean, so, so phenomenology in, 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 in its Husserlian form is a form of transcendental philosophy, of course, and also in its early Heideggerian form. So it, it is, and what exactly, so I have noticed that Kant is missing here because one of the things that doesn't show in this dialectic is how it is that after there is a rift between, say, Parmenides, Heraclitus, Descartes, Locke, and so on, there comes somebody who tries to grapple with what was coming from both and try to reconcile the two or to take what was you know, true about either or, or about each. And Kant is the, the, paradigmatic, the paradigmatic modern example, and I think Husserl and Heidegger are trying to do something quite similar. In other words, Heidegger's 
So just to focus on Heidegger, because he seems he's more consequential for the cluster that eventually leads to the, you know, sort of death of metaphysics derail and, you know, that the, the, the CCRU and the K are, uh, take issue with. But Heidegger's early project begins as a transcendental phenomenology, right? Being in time is a transcendental phenomenology, which he calls a fundamental ontology. And in this regard, he's repeating the Kantian project of precisely trying to sort of adjudicate what are the conditions, transcendental conditions of experience, but not just circumscribing those transcendental conditions of experience to the conditions of representation or cognition. So Heidegger describes existential conditions of access that are more pri primary or primitive than the purely representational forms of aesthetic intuition and intellectual subsumption or conceptualization that Kant describes. And even more, more so than Husserl, wants to dislodge uh, our practical know-how from this kind of representational framework of intentionality that still had Husserl beholden to the notion of the object, of object, you know, the transcendental subject on the one hand and the object on the other. So what, what I think that it, it begins like this, right, with a kind of like attempt to reconcile this kind of, on the one hand, I, you know, rationalist transcendental project of trying to describe invariant structures, but of experience precisely, kind of like what Kant was doing. Kant is precisely seen as trying to reconcile rationalism and empiricism because when he tries to describe the invariant conditions of experience, the conditions of possibility of experience, he tries to describe these generic concepts which describe how it is that we empirically receive and you know, experience the world through our aesthetic uh, faculties, right? Through the forms of space and time. And similarly, Heidegger wants to do something exactly like that. He wants to reconcile the idea of describing these invariant structures, but to describe experiential structures. Now, what happens after Heidegger is that the, when the transcendental project, just like Kant's project, faces a kind of deadlock, methodological, and we can't really get into this right now, but that's like, uh, we devoted a bit of this into in, in, my, in, my, in my previous seminar, uh, a fair chunk to, to, to talking about this bit, but uh, when the transcendental project fails for a variety of reasons, you have the unleashing of a sequence, which is basically this kind of historicist hermeneutic sequence in which progressively the aims of achieving precisely a kind of transcendental phenomenology or a fundamental ontology become increasingly precarious to the point where you start seeing this kind of rhetoric of maybe philosophy is done, maybe, you know, it's the end of metaphysics and the beginning of something like post-metaphysical thinking, but this is no longer really philosophy. Philosophy is metaphysics. And this gets pushed to an extreme, especially after, you know, the, the, the sort of onslaught of the, the postmodern historicist and deconstructionist saga, when you get to somebody like Jameson, right, who very closely separates, for example, theory from philosophy, and even goes as far as saying, you know, theory is on the side of dialectics, on the side of historicism, on the side of change. Philosophy is always totalizing, blah, 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 blah. So this is the junction which the CCRU wants to oppose or situates itself. So it begins with Heidegger's sort of like Kantian gesture, but Kant is always the beginning of, a, of an end. Uh, you know, Kant always is like, Kant designates a limit point in modern philosophy, just like Heidegger designates a limit point in the 20th century philosophy. Um, because in trying to reconcile the rationalist and empiricist vectors, Kant finally you know, brought philosophy altogether to a kind of deadlock and, and to the ground, and Heidegger did the same. So what we're going to see is precisely how we are today in the contemporary neo-rationalist uh, sort of configuration, and it's prescient ongoing hurdle with you know a, a variety of other approaches coming from uh, you know orientations much more amenable to the results of the CCRU for example we're reaching this kind of like heightened tension conceptual tension in the contemporary context and that it will be interesting to see how this takes shape um, hopefully that's enough uh, I do need to 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 make haste to to reach the end of uh, of, of the day um, but if anybody wants to say anything else, please jump in too. So, oh yeah, I mean, of course, the final the final point in this in this uh, slide is that our predicament or the contemporary iteration. This is the basic thesis of the Kaya, 
um, represents the, the, the rationalist orientation. And we'll see Peter Howard actually has a much cleaner sort of exposition about how, you know, the KA relates back to French rationalism. But uh, in, this, in this tradition, the essential iteration of the thesis is that mathematics or semiotics thinks of matter purely as structure or pure form and of subjectivity as a break or cut with the ontological order of the same or the one or representation or you name it, right? But it is mathematics and semiotics which gives you the basic vocabulary of ontology on the one hand, and ontology, uh, and, you know, uh, it's mathematics is pure structure, pure form, no content. It decants itself from any kind of residual uh, relativization to natural language or to the sensory or to anything qualitative or essential. So it's a relational ontology as well. And subjectivity gets within this kind of model inscribed as a kind of exception, break, cut, fissure, or distortion within the relational order. So there's an attempt to think of being a structure on the one hand and subjectivity as something that happens within the structural order as a disturbance or intrusion to the structural order. Um, on the other hand, the CCRU, which is the higher to the empiricist tradition, conceives of cybernetics, and particularly in its deleuze guattarian sort of frame, to think of materiality as purely functionally or mechanically without intellectual or aesthetic mediation. And consequently of subjectivity, not uh, you know, in continuity with the, the kind of like Lacanian psychoanalytic structural conception, but schizoanalytically, they say, as something that is actually completely impersonal or inhuman, uh, something that operates at the subhuman and superhuman levels and that it is completely resistant to narrativization into the traditional tropes of political or psychological or phenomenological uh, agency. So and obviously you can see very cleanly in this formulation how it is that both conceptions are almost diametrically opposed to each other, right, in, in, in their core. But both, nevertheless, notice this, are agree in trying to conceive of a concept, in an, an ontology and a conception of the subject that is essentially freed from its supports on any kind of like experiential uh, faculties, right? So both try to do away with this kind of residual phenomenological vitalist or fac facultative uh, wellspring. So that's, that's you know, the, 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 the core iteration. It's a crass genealogy, but it, it will have to do for now. Now, let me just say a, a couple of things uh, about each of the two circles of, of, a, of, of a slightly more historical nature. Um, now, the Cirque de, le cercle de Epistemologie, uh, however you pronounce that, uh, was a collective entity which was promoted above all by Jacques-Alain Miller and Jean-Claude, sorry, that was a typo there, Milner, throughout its years and across the 10 volumes of the journal Cayers, it included contributions by the following members. And this is just like a, a small, well, not a small, but so uh, there's a website, which I'll, I'll send a link to, which compiles the, the, the majority of information. It's, it's a really comprehensive website, mostly edited by uh, Peter Hallward, but also Ray Brassier and a few others. So they, they, they have the section where they divide the members of the, of the, of the you know uh, circular the the epistemology and people who who participated in the career in a very useful manner. So notice that in the in to the left hand side the members of the circular the epistemology and the editorial board included Alain Badiou in volumes eight to ten only. Alain Gros uh, I actually don't, never know how to pronounce this but I think it's Gros Grosiard, uh, Jacques Alain Miller, Jean Claude Milner, and François Renaud. So these are the core sort of constituents of this collective. Um, and to the right hand side, you have a sort of f further people who were actually aligned or members of the collective. Now, what's interesting is that even though Badiou only was there for the last two volumes, it is during this last period, these last two volumes, that we see something like a complete overhaul, not overhaul, but a, a very clear philosophical direction being taken place. I mean, Badiou, really grabbed the insights that had been brewing for the first seven volumes. And in these last two volumes, really attempted something like a comprehensive systematic formalization of this. And this is where you get the kind of final, uh, this is why Badiou is the kind of philosophical hire to this project uh, across its 10 volumes and the kind of offspring of it. 
Uh, but throughout its years, the the the, the Cahiers published a variety of authors, including Derrida. I, I just like put him in like you know in purple, so you could like obviously the big names here, you know, uh, Lacan, Foucault, Derrida, Althusser. We're not going to be reading any of Althusser, Derrida, or Foucault's contributions to the Cahiers because they were relatively minor. Honestly, I mean, Derrida was really on another jam. He was not, he just basically threw a contribution in there. Same with Althusser, his contribution is not all that significant. It's one text each. Same with Foucault, not very interesting. Jacques Lacan, on the other hand, did have a very important text, which was later compiled in decree, which is called uh, Science and Truth. Now, we're going to be reading that. Uh, I added that to the syllabus uh, for next week, so that's going to be one of our readings. Uh, and that's an important text, which I think sets the, the foundations for much of what we're going to be talking about. Because in that text, uh, Lacan launches an interrogation of the nature of science. And as you know, as I mentioned to you before, one of the things that attracted the people from Althusser's group and Althusser himself to the company of Lacan was how to reforge the conception of science or the idea of science and its separation from ideology precisely by drawing from resources from structuralism, right? So Lacan himself, as you know, I mean, psychoanalysis itself has always been haunted by the question of science, how to consolidate itself as a scientific discourse as Freud himself and Lacan himself thought it could be. Um, that it never quite achieved it is another story or another argument to be had. So here's an interesting uh, historical detail of the composition of the group, which comes from the introduction uh, by Peter Hallward, which we will be reading also for, for next session, but uh, I'll just read this out. Indeed, the circle seems to have been a more capacious category than the editorial board and contained figures like Bouveres, whose projects had a bearing on the concerns of the journal, or indeed who may have contributed, but who were not involved in the production of, of its content. The circle itself grew lar much larger with the volume eight, with the addition of Alain Badiou and several others. Badiou in particular, who was a member of the editorial board, unlike for example, Jean-Marie Vallier, or Vallier, who only uh, joined the circle, would exercise a decisive influence on the trajectory of the final two volumes of the journal devoted to the genealogy of the sciences and formalization. As you know, formalization is a, is, 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 is a term that was popularized, or not popularized, I should say, but was coined or used by Lacan to describe what was peculiar about the operation of psychoanalytic theory as a discourse in relationship to all other discourses. And anyway, so here's the link at the bottom of this page to this website, which is an uh, immeasurable rich resource for all things CAE. Uh, you have, you know, list of names, uh, bi bibliography of their contributions, annotated translation, original text, links to the two collections. And it's the same group that, that compiled and, and, and were responsible for this uh, two-volume translation of, of the major text concept and form. So we, we owe this majorly to Peter Hallward, who is a, a great scholar in his own right. Um, so just to... to to give a little bit more meat to the bones, the late emphasis laid on formalization, which was a term popular, popularized by Lacan to describe the way in which psychoanalytic discourse produce a formal ideography of the unconscious or a theory of the subject beyond the figurations of ego psychology and philosophy, would set the grounds to think of a new mode of theorization, materialist ontology, and as a mode of practice, and a new mode of practice, I should say, sorry, Marxism. In doing so, it brought together intimate interests of philosophers from different orientations in the French post-world context, the Althusserian school, Lacanian psychoanalysis, etc. Somebody just wrote to the chat, just let me see. Someone would explain Lacan. <laughs> uh, if someone would explain Lacan in such a way to me, I'd find it quite wrong. Well, uh, is, 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 that, uh, is this a response to something that was said by me or something that was said before? Um, so I'm sorry for my very uh, oblivious comment. I'm just uh, referring to the one sentence description of uh, Kaye Plural Analyse uh, stands uh, as a rationalist. Yeah. Where you say about like, structure and then situation is exit out of it. And I think Lacan himself would find it slightly ridiculous with like uh, this understanding of it. Um, yeah, I'm just like, yeah, I understand Kayapuranas is not Lacan, but uh, just wanted to say. But uh, I mean, uh, um, ridiculous, what is ridiculous? 
uh, I mean, uh, can we can you can you can you go back to that slide just so I have the text? The I'm, the I'm not I'm not really prepared to like give a different summary to Lacan right now. So maybe yeah. Uh, but this this one or the one before? Which one? No, no, pre previous. No, uh, it was it was like ten minutes ago. Uh, I, I, I mean. Can I, like, for example, just just to make something say very something very specific. Yes. I don't think Lacan would agree that uh, uh, um, what is it? is some kind of exit out of the symbolic order or somehow breaks down. And breaks oh, of course down not. No, no, no. No, like no. no, no, no. Lacan would not say that. No, Lacan would not say that. No, Lacan does not think the subject is anything like a cut or a kapoor or anything like that. That is something that the, the, the uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the Cahier pour Analyse tried to use in a discussion with Lacan to try to use the resources of Lacanian psychoanalysis and also the resources of, you know, structuralist linguistics more generally to reconstitute dialectical materialism. So something like what you get with, so Althusser and Badiou will have a notion of you know, uh, the subject as a cut or as an eventual interruption to the order. That's not Lacan, but that is inspired by the Lacanian, first of all, conception of the subject and the structuralist conception of, you know, ontology, a structuralist sort of uh, basis for ontology. So I'm not trying to say Lacan is a rationalist. Lacan is an anti-philosopher and, you know, whether he is a rationalist, if, if you want to call him a philosopher, whether he would qualify as a rationalist or not, it's, it's, it's not something that I would be prepared to say, but regardless, what I would say is that the, the project of the CAE was an attempt to negotiate with Lacanian psychoanalysis in the attempt to reconstitute philosophy. And, and Valentin uses a Lacan like this too when he talks about machines, Valentin. Uh, I mean, uh, so, Two things about this. Uh, first of all, like my understanding of Lacan is, uh, which uh, a lot of you would probably find suspect a little bit because, uh, uh, but my understanding of him is very close to what you actually say about CCRU. Mm -hmm. Even though we know how CCRU was not really into Lacan explicitly. Um, this is first thing. Secondly, like just just to continue like my kind of uh, explanation why Lacan would not fit. Uh, this Lacanian notion of symbolic uh, and Lacanian overall understanding of like social order or any kind of like epistemological order uh, of like that is perceived by something is and uh, his like schemes of how subject actually works and the things like this whole topological stuff and what he tries to formalize are two very different things, both of which are you know structural. Right. In, a, in a sense that you know you paint like different like arrows around points, but it's like very different uh, ontological orders in a way, right? And uh, like what exactly is like escapes what uh, I find the whole thing about like what is this uh, structured order and then subject escapes it. It's very romantic, very naive, and very funny for people who really read, read Lacan well. Well, no, no, but 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 you got you got to be careful about uh, keeping uh, different uh, scorebooks here because I agree. I think you're right that Lacan would consider something like what Badiou does with his theory of the subject as a romantic voluntarist residue, precisely when he describes the subject as something that erupts eventually and just you know in the ontological order and breaks them and you know that is precisely. I, I think you're right. Lacan would find that to be risible. And Lacan finds it risible, and you're right also. The reason why Lacan appears to you closer to perhaps the CCRU is because Lacan was an anti philosopher, and he, and he did not think in this regard that you, know, you had precisely room left for such a conception of agency. So maybe the reason why you're finding it ridiculous is because you side with Lacan against what the Cahier would try to do with Lacan. In other words, that you. You do not think that, you know, those philosophers who try to weave a theory of the subject, a subversion, eventual truth, you name it, out of the Lacanian sort of you know, framework, uh, succeed at all. Now, that's that's a fair contention, and I actually 
w one of the claims that I would make is in agreement with you or with Lacan in this case, uh, that, yeah, that there is a kind of, you know, and I, I mentioned this before, that when somebody like Badiou tries to organize or weave a theory of the subject as kind of radical subversion, he ultimately relapses into a kind of voluntarist, kind of quasi-Sartrean, uh, you know, conception of, of subversion. And I think that this is precisely, as you, as you well put, a kind of romantic residue or relapse that vitiates not only the kind of, uh, you know, the structuralist, like, imminent grounds of ontology, I mean, that's kind of its point, right? Like, it, the subject shatters the ontological order, but that it, 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 it even, um, it even undermines the idea of trying to escape from a kind of stale voluntarism, right? Uh, and I think that that's precisely the kind of thing that Lacan was perhaps too cynical to fall to, even if, you know, that comes with its own set of problems. Um, and I think Land and Lacan would see eye to eye on this, actually. You know, I think both would agree, if, if, if there's one thing they would agree on, is that they would find the Baduian or, you know, Rancierian model of of subjectivation risible or or, or 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 at the very least you know romantically inflated. Um, but I, I don't mean, know. The Rancierian model of subjectivation is very close. No, I mean not very close, but I think it's kind of spiritually close. So like Kenyan, as far as I understand it, because it's like what Lacan is, explains as double and thunder. I, I'm not sure if you should like waste, waste time on it. I mean, uh, me and my Lacan, yeah. But I'm just like. Um, just one like I mean I don't really understand yet the position of Kaya Polonalis towards Lacan and now I see it uh, more specifically after this discussion. So well, that, you know, that will, we that don't will, have to. Like, no, I mean yeah, but but just to answer to that, just like very quickly, it's like uh, well, one of the things we'll do next time. I mean for next session, we'll be reading Jacqueline, uh, Jacqueline Miller's text on structure. You know the the very important text on structure and Badiou's uh, very important contribution to that debate. So I think there's, there's actually quite a bit there. And also you're right also that, uh, you know, focusing specifically on the structuralist quote unquote uh, um, period of Lacan, which of course makes sense, uh, you know, just historically and genealogically considering the years in which the circle of epistemology was running, seems to also elide the late work that Lacan does when he transitions or tries to do work with topology as well. So, and, and an interesting discussion would be, well, you know, does, what does that imply f with regards to the earlier, you know, structuralism that he gets from Jacobson and so on, blah, blah, blah. How do you negotiate these two things? Especially when you consider that philosophers like Badiou then play a particularly strong role in the, uh, or place uh, a particularly strong emphasis in the role that topology plays in philosophy. So I think regardless, uh, these questions are going to be much more hopefully clear uh, by next week. Okay, so uh, just going back to this, the Cahiers uh, la launched an interrogation of the relationship between the concepts of form and structure, and they adopted, as we've been saying, a, a broadly structuralist strategy to tackle the theoretical problems of ontology and epistemology, as well as practical questions of psychoanalytic clinical practice, like Lacan does, of course, but also questions of political organization and collective action, like Althusser and his group tried to do, and by you as well. Thus, structuralism became a lever not only to rekindle dialectics as a theoretical option, but to reiterate the unity between thinking and practice that characterizes dialectical materialism. And that's an important thing, uh, that the Cahiers was as much interested in philosophy in the abstract mode, but of course, as I was mentioning, it's, it's essentially also an attempt to reconstitute the valences of dialectical materialist theory for a political practice, for a collective political practice, for the left, basically, right, of course. Now, the structuralism in the broadest possible sense, and this is just a working definition, this is the one that Peter Hallward gives, which I think is good enough, uh, can be understood as attributing, quote, unilateral causal, causal power to the relations that structure configurations of elements in whatever domain, mathematical, linguistic, psychological, economic, literary, rather than a core primer, primacy to the presumed nature or essence that these, of these elements themselves, which are given instead as effects of the structure. Paul word uh, this is from the introduction. Uh, so um, I won't get into you know rehearsing this or unpacking this uh, definition because this will be one of the topics that we will uh, be exploring next time. But notice that one one of the interesting things is that 
a structuralism as a model, uh, as a formal methodological model for, for the cahier, emerges from this kind of social scientific nexus and background. And it really becomes then sort of amplified into or bloated into a kind of general generalized, I should say, into an ontological register or incorporated into an ontological register. And you can probably see just by reading this definition how it echoes the conception of science that was already formulated by Bachelard in the 30s, right, that, that, that I mentioned before. So those things are all together, right? An attempt to reconstitute our concepts of science, the idea of trying to appropriate an, a structural understanding of ontology into a dialectical materialist philosophy that would be sufficient to forge a concept of the subject that could be amenable to a emancipatory revolutionary politics, right? So Excuse that's me, the- Daniel, yeah. just one quick announcement. So maybe we have about nine minutes left and then we're gonna spend the final 10 minutes um, formalizing the presenters and the respondents for the Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, I only have two more two more slides to give, and 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 then we'll we'll do it, and we can we can close this very quickly. Okay. So the cybernetic culture research unit, uh, predominantly a student-run collective, right, which ran out of Warwick University between 1995 and 2003, was founded and promoted by the works of Sadie Plant and Nick Land. Uh, was closely aligned to the attempts to use cybernetic and schizoanalytic philosoph uh, philosophical modes, sorry, elaborate above all in Deleuze and Guattari's capitalism and schizophrenia as a model for an alternative to structural psychoanalytic and philosophical attempt to rekindle dialectics. Um, it meshed cyberpunk art, Jungle House musical production, and Lovecraftian literary mythology, among several other influences, leading to a variety of experimental projects and productive forms. The Virtual Futures Conference, the Syzygy Residency in South London, in collaboration with the art collective, that collaboration with Orphan Drift, uh, a huge number of like uh, you know collaborations and practices, which really speaks to the to the you know um, nomadic character of of the CCRU and to the, its wildly irreverential uh, spirit. It really did not. It, it it wasn't only like the cahier itself was a kind of um, you know, testing the borders of what was admissible to academic discourse, they really went all the way out, right? And, and sort of meshing with most of popular production and art that were completely, you know, uh, sacrilegious or, 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 or debased or considered low. So the thinkers associated with this group besides Land and Sadi and Sadi Plant are from different provenances and Often tracking the authorship of the text to the collective and the contributions of its members is it's impossible, right? Because they, they write as a collective. And other than you, when you read a, a, an article that's written by just one of them, the actual collection of texts is just a mishmash, right? So it's, it's everybody and nobody at the same time. So it's Kod Wuishun, Amy Ireland, Ray Brassier, Manuel Delanda, Simon Critchley, Mark Fisher, Ian Hamilton Grand, Reza Megaristana, Negaristana, Negaristani, Luciano Parisi, Code 9, Robin McKay, Harry Kunzru, uh, you know, you name it. And there's more names that have been associated with it, but this is just like a small roster of the figures that have been associated with, with the CCRU at some point or other. And um, one question. Absolutely. Manuel Delander and Simon Critchley were uh, the contribute to the CCRU work? Well, it, this is... If not, if not to the textual writing, then he was definitely involved at some point with, with the, 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 the environs. He was participating in the debates. He was talking to the people. I think um, earlier... Critchley yeah. seems like the, like the arch enemy of what CCU is attacking. I was surprised well, to see that charlatan yeah. Critchley on this list as well. But, that... Uh, that is the that is to me the the odd pick if I had to because Manuel de Land after all is a Deleuzian so at the end of the day he's going you know it does make sense that he would go to to this kind of uh, nook but but Simon Critchley <laughs> on the other hand that's the one that I uh, and and incidentally I have no idea what he actually did again one of the things that becomes very difficult to track and I've tried I've written to Ray and others to try to sort of get my head or wrap my head around what he actually did what it was about about but again tracking the, the precise contributions is a, is a kind of impossible task at this point at some point somebody will have to write a history of this uh, in a kind of much more patient manner doing interviews and talking to all the the subjects yes but I'm wondering about 
I'm yeah. wondering about Amy Ireland. I think she was maybe five years old when CCRU was actually operating <laughs> or something, or maybe not even alive because Amy oh, was yeah. young. Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, this set of thinkers, I mean, Ressa was, of course, only, I mean, he jumped in after the disintegration of, of, of the Warwick Collective itself. And, you know, so, so it's like a, a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of these names are, like uh, late bloomers or they joined late into the party. I mean, at the end of the day, the CCRU was still going until maybe five years ago. You know, it was going in the blogosphere. It was going around, um, you know, again, what do you call the CCRU? It's, it's, it's sort of fishy. You know, Amy has been doing a lot of work on that. I mean, she's one of the people that, 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 that is most sort of illustrious and with regards to, for example, making sense of the pneumogram and all that stuff. But, um, you know, she's been associated with it. Now, whether you want to call her a member or not, that's a different story. I mean, the CCRU was not a, it, it was much less formal than the CAE, of course, right? Where you had an editorial board, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I mean, this was just like a think tank, a, a production collective where people jumped in, did something, jumped out, and there were collaborations and events and publications and all that. But, you know, it's, it's, it was a very nomadic, existence or, or or structure so yeah i mean it's it's so so these you know i mean this is just a, a, a this is a set of names of people that have been associated with this uh now whether they they are actually members or not that's who knows right but it's 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 particularly hard and this is the last point i make in this slide which is it's really hard uh now to to track this because now that nick land has been shrouded in political controversy uh, a lot of people have just sort of turned uh, 180 completely and sort of try to disavow and distance themselves from this altogether. And they don't want any truck with this uh, associations anymore just because of, you know, professional or ethical, uh, you know, uh, survival, I suppose, or something. But so, so, so that makes things slightly harder. Okay. And this is the last thing I'll say, and, and, and we'll get to logistics. Um, so, Without getting ahead of ourselves, hyperstition is the process whereby fictions make themselves real in a way that is not simply reducible to a crass idealism that claims beliefs or thoughts articulate reality, right? So part of what I was claiming is that the Cybernetic Cultural Research Unit, uh, unit is trying to weave something that they name hyperstition, right, or hyperstitional practice. And this is precisely this kind of mesh of Lovecraftian Gothic mythology with kind of Borgesian, you know, theory fiction with, you know, metaphysics and so on and so forth and cyberpunk. So that gives way to this new practice, this kind of like radical, you know, uh, practice called hyperstitional practice. And this constitutes itself as a, what Nick Land at one point calls an anti-logos which defies the traditional valences of philosophy and philosophical discourse and of the dialectical method itself, and presents itself in the form of a kind of practice as metaphysics, which openly draws from non-standard numeracies like the Kabbalah, occultist practices, and other forms of experimental expressive mediums to achieve something like a global defiance to the order of sense and of the human. So practice as metaphysics becomes a kind of, the, the, the philosophical bedrock of this entire project um and yeah yeah well the thing is uh, you know people can can shift gears right because ray brassier was uh, i'm sorry I'm, I'm reading from uh, uh, sasha's question would it make much, much more sense to speak of amy ireland as a member of laboria land and ccru well one thing to keep in mind is this is not exclusive right so somebody like ray who was you know openly associated with the ccru or reza who you know was at some point i suppose member of the ccru is now squarely allotted in, you know, neo-rationalism uh, and so on and so forth. So migration can happen, right? Um, the history of philosophy is ripe with these examples, and this is no exception, right? Um, but regardless, so so just to just to, to, to wrap this this point up, uh, uh, is the idea is that you know this kind of anti-logos finds us as bedrock and kind of practices metaphysics. And what this yields ultimately is a kind of historical narrative which, in which you have these protagonists or these you know, subjects, which are these mythological creatures, these proto-Lovecraftian conceptual monsters, 
which organize uh, you know, macro processes of, of human history or in human history within human history, you know, in scales of time, which disrupt any kind of scale of time or, or uh, you know, historicity relative to our phenomenological, uh, psychological, or sociocultural frames of understanding. So this is, a, what is interesting is that this mythology leads to a kind of reconsideration of an impersonal or inhuman subject, which becomes then bolstered through kind of Lovecraftian mythology into a kind of demonology, right? I mean, and I'm sure you all have a sort of have encountered this at some, uh, to some extent or other, but the CCRU weaves this extraordinary roster of agencies and characters that are from organizations to demons and so on and so forth th th that are surrogates for philosophical concepts, but which help them build this kind of narrative about what's going on right now, like what, you know, about, about the, the course of history as it goes. Um, so we're going to be talking, of course, about how, about that, how the, the practices of metaphysics becomes bloated into a roster of characters. Now, I was going to say um, something about where we're going to look, look ahead, but that can that can wait for, for next time. Let me just stop doing this, I guess. Um, how do I stop sharing? Did I stop sharing already? Yes, or yes, stop sharing. Sure. Okay. okay, great, 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 great. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So now um, what we're going to do is there are six remaining sessions and for each session here, I'm going to share my screen. Yes, yes, share. Jamie, did you say there are six sessions? Six remaining sessions. No, there are seven. Seven, seven remaining sessions. So, so everyone, there are seven remaining sessions for, thank you, Mo. There are seven remaining sessions. And for each session, there is going to be one presenter and one respondent. So here I've shared, hopefully you can all see the screen. Also, uh, can I say one thing very quickly? Um, is the, I, I'm going to be adding two texts um, okay. in, in, in two of the weeks, one by Sadie Plant and uh, another one that I'm still debating, but uh, the Sadie Plant text will go Probably on week, uh, I have to look at the syllabus myself, but um, I think it's got to go on week uh, seven or six. Okay. Okay, just, just that, yeah, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay, yeah. so the next two sessions will concern uh, the Cahier pour l'analyse. So we'll need four volunteers, um, one to present next week, and one to respond next week. So presentations. Um, typically around 15 minutes or so. Uh, responses usually around five minutes or so. Sometimes they range a little more. So um, can I get a set of volunteers for next week, September 28th, on Peter Hallward, Jacqueline Miller, Francois, and uh, Badu, and, and the rest? <laughs> um, I, I will... have a question. I have a more formal question. Um, do we all have to do one presentation and one response, or just one of them? That's like okay. minimum, actually. Minimum is one, but you can do. No, no, no. I, I wanted to ask if I have um, just the, the, the formal uh, requirements. Um, if I have to do minimum one presentation, or if one response is also okay. Yeah, minimum one presentation and response, but. Of course, you can do up to two because it's good to have two presenters and two respondents every week, but mm -hmm. hopefully not more because we also have to leave room for the lecture and for just general discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will, I will gladly present. I'm uh, very uh, passionate about these uh, theorists next week. If I can present on them, I'd be very happy to. Anyone want, to, anyone want to respond? Also, of to course, it? anything I say can be over overwritten by Daniel because he's really the, arbit the uh, ultimate arbitrator here. I mean, I'm happy to have everybody, uh, like each of you, present once uh, in whatever week. And also, just just quick quick question: uh, we, you for your presentation um, in each of the weeks, you don't have to present on every text. Obviously, you can you can choose to focus either on a particular text or on a set of questions or issues that sprawl across the text. So what, what I really, I mean, 
try to avoid just coming here to try to summarize because that's like we don't need that. What what I'm more interested in in doing is is, is trying to see you think with the with these thinkers. So even if it's a particular issue that that attracts your attention in one of the texts that you're reading from the, from that week's reading list, or it's a set of or it's a set of questions that overlaps with a bunch of authors. Uh, regardless, I'm I'm happy to 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 have it be that way. What I definitely don't want is just for somebody to come and summarize a, a text, right? Because that's that's a I mean, I'll be I'll be trying to like give pointers to to guide the discussion for, for all the text. So we don't really need that. I want to see more like a critical engagement and constructive engagement if possible. OK, so who wants to respond to Ekin? Uh I would like to. OK, great. OK, so now. Uh, yes, I would like to take the one or one of the presentation. I think um, uh, Daryl or I cannot see the name also wanted to present at um, October 5th, and I also would like to present there. You would like to present or respond? Uh, respond to Ekin and present at the 5th of October. Okay, okay. So he's gotta be responding in week two, and he's gonna be presenting on week yeah, three. Yeah, that's fine. So does someone want to respond to Eric on October 5th? Badu, Zizek. No, Eric is presenting on week two, so he will be responding to Eric on week two as well, I presume, right? I think that's how it works, or am I wrong? Um, so I, I wanted to, in, in week three, I wanted to present, and right. in week two, I wanted to respond. No, let's right, have, right, right. have someone else yeah. respond to Eric on week three. Uh, but Daryl also wanted to present at 5th October. Uh, Jamie, Jamie, J Jamie. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The responses have to be on the same week, obviously, right? Like, I mean, somebody presents and then there's a respondent right after. That's the, the general template, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Eric is, is presenting on week three. Yes. Um, yes. And then week two, we're... Uh, next, who's week. next week I'm presenting. Ekrin? So Ekrin's presenting week two Ekrin. and, and then... No. I'm sorry. That's Akin. how I understood. Akin presents week two, and then, and then Eric responds to it on week two, yes, and then Eric right. presents on, on week, week three. three. Yeah, yeah. But then, you don't know then, who responds yes. to Eric you on week tell, three. That's right. exactly what I. I'll, I'll respond to Eric. If well, no, please. Let's get some. Let's get someone new because what's... in the in the <laughs> chat, Daryl is saying that he can respond on oh, uh, okay. Okay. week Thank three. Daryl, I can't right, see okay, the chat because I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so for okay week four. Okay, so now this is uh, the foray into the CCRU. So it's McKay and some of these uh, communal texts by the CCRU. So is there anyone who is interested in presenting on these? Oh, also, if you scroll down, which, okay, if I scroll down and you watch me, um, we have some land and some more CCRU. So this is McKay, land, CCRU. Anyone want to present on these? Mm, I think, uh, no, <laughs> no. You sure? <laughs> Uh, I, because I wanted to uh, to actually respond uh, because I was uh, more interested in uh, presenting uh, on a week with uh, Seti Plant. Okay. Uh, that's got to be in the that's got to be in the last in the last uh, in the last module. So that's got to be later. Okay. So oh, it's okay. fine. We can still decide it and write it down. So then we don't have to go over this again. Yeah. That's I fine. mean, I'm I'm cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, but who wants to present on October twelfth? Somebody, Land, McKay, come on. Okay, I, I will present. Thank you. Now, would someone like to respond on October 12th? Sasha, you can also respond on Sadie Plan in the last. Week. Yeah, yeah, and I would like, yeah, I would like to respond on uh, the session on Xenofem on uh, cyber and xenofeminism. Beautiful. Can, uh, so some people are writing in the chat. Can, can just for, 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 for organization, can you just jump into the like? Can you speak, please? Yeah, please, because so, I I can't read them. Yeah, right yeah, it's, it's it's like getting a little like, but um, yeah. So we need uh, we need a respondent for week four still. Yes, I'll do it then. Okay. 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 Cool. Ekin. Okay. okay now. And and then I'll I'll present in session five uh on the nineteenth. Great. Anybody wants to respond week five? Session five, sir. Let me respond week five. Great. Okay. <laughs> Let me, yes. 
Okay. It's Valentin. I'm so sorry about it. No, we, we, we know your voice, Valentin. It's okay. Yeah. Session six, who wants to present? I can present. Ses can you hear me? Yes, Stefano. Okay, so, okay, I am. Yeah, Phenomenal. I can. Great. And who respond? wants to respond to Stefano? I'll do it. Arnan, good. Yeah. Okay, session seven? seven? Uh, I can present on session seven. Yeah, that's Great. a good one. Okay. Can, Let's I, can I respond to session yes. seven? Federico, there we go. Okay, and, for, and for the last week, we have a respondent already. Sasha is responding. And, uh, and yeah, the, the Sadie will, will, will go in later. Also, uh, just remind yourself, those for next week, there's, gonna, there's all the contacts also um, that, that, that I added. I will send you the updated. Like, uh, uh, can I present a response some week? Is there anyone? Yeah, is there anyone who hasn't volunteered? Me. I haven't yeah. moved. Okay, can you present on the last week on Land, Gracier, and the Accelerationist and the Xenofeminist? Sure, yeah. Okay, beautiful. Great, so we're, we're all set, right? I think Alan uh, is- I have, a, I have a question. So I don't have a week when I respond, so can I maybe be a second responder for the week three? Absolutely. Uh, sure. Okay, sure. why not? Alan, do you have anything? No, I didn't get anything. I I would maybe I can present like. Uh, well, so there are some people. There's some people who are going a few times. Like uh, Ekin, for example, is going a few times. Ekin, would you mind? Well, I'm mind? only I'm I'm going once. I'm I'm presenting once or responding once. I, I know, I know, but Alan doesn't have anything right now. So is there someone who is who has two oh, slots? I'm not. I'm Ekin. I'm not calling you. Up, but, okay, I just wasn't sure. Two presentations, right? Except uh, maybe Sasha. No, nobody has two presentations. Not no, even Sasha. No, no I'm, 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 I'm only responding uh, on the week six, and I'm. Okay, never mind. Six. Sorry. Yeah, yes. everybody is. Just someone. someone. Uh, Jamie, can you, uh, can, can you let me uh, just do this, this, this bit? Uh, so, yeah. Alan, Alan. Yeah. What would you like to do? Which, what would, what week would you like to present or respond? I guess like uh, six, seven, or eight. Any, okay. Any any preference? Mm, Take a... No, it's okay. No, I guess maybe six or eight, but I'm okay with anyone. Okay, so how about you, you do also a, a, a presentation on week six? Okay, on the material okay. side. Okay, I know you. Okay. Can... Yeah? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's just do that. Okay. And, and okay. We're... Okay. Well, great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coordinating Thank that in a, in a timely manner. Uh, so, Daniel, is there anything that you want to say to us uh, in conclusion? Uh, yeah. So, I will be sending the updated syllabus with the context. It's uh, science and truth. That's included in in Ecrib. Uh, so, I will be also uploading that because you can find it in that collection, not in the in the cahier. Uh, that's an important text, I think. And uh, other than that, yeah, no, nothing. Oh, well, yeah. What well, I, I should just say. So, at the end of the course, there's a paper. All of you have to write a paper, seven to 10 pages. The paper is very simply any kind of critical engagement with any of the materials of the course topics, weaving it back to any of your own concerns. Uh, it doesn't have to be a you know, critical philosophy piece, but I'm, I'm interested in seeing you think with these materials and try to incorporate it into your own stuff. Now, now, yeah? What I was gonna add is like, due to the significance and kind of importance of this seminar, historical importance of this seminar, we will be interested. We, I mean, New Center will be interested in, in quickly gathering these essays and maybe putting them together in the form of a compilation essays, both as a PDF and a print publication. So I totally encourage you to take your essay seriously because we could have a really wonderful publication out of this study that, that Danielle has work so hard to put together in terms of syllabus, right? And also remember, one of the easiest way to, to sort of like conduct this is to also weave it to your presentation because you're gonna spend time reading, reading that text thoroughly so you can probably build your essay closer or weave it to your, the, the text you pick for your presentation and then pick other things that relate it. And also you can always communicate with us and with Daniel via email to kind of like get more resources or like more sources that that will help you develop good stuff so we can maybe yes. maybe have a nice publication at the end of the course this is something we were going to be doing with select seminars 
starting this year. So I totally encourage you guys to take it seriously because a, a lovely publication can come out of it. Okay, uh, one more thing, uh, just, just because um, if anything, so I, I have to always strike a balance between uh, trying to be philosophically introductory and be rigorous. And that's a difficult balance to strike because I understand different people have different backgrounds or formations. So I, I don't want to be excessively jargony or excessively convoluted or, 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 or you know. And I, so what I ask of, of those of you who have training on one particular aspect or tradition or something like this is to try to be um, uh, sort of generous in the sense of give time to, to sort of introduce the concepts and we can we can go with this because you know some people have read some parts of this stuff some people have not read any of this at all and so you know you have to work your way up little by little if anything seems obtuse or obscure unpersuasive or confused of course that's what we're here for so so i'm, I'm happy to always be sort of uh you know sort of questioned and interrogated Things will become progressively clearer as we move along. But if anything didn't stick out as 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 as, as you know clear or convincing during the seminar that you want to ask or interrogate more carefully, I'm always available via email. Everybody will tell you that I like getting into philosophy chit chat regardless. So, you know, uh, if if you just want to write to me or talk to me via social media or whatever, I'm I'm always there. You know, happy to talk philosophy. Yeah. Um, Okay, There's also so, the Google Classroom for extension of the conversation. Right. So, yeah, so and any if, medium. If anyone yeah. has any difficulty accessing the classroom or anything like that, you know, feel free to contact us as well. I wanted, I, I wanted to, um, to say I have two courses uh, by uh, Vincent Le, one on Nick Land, which traces his whole work from his, from his dissertation to like um, to the CCIU stuff, and then one course which is totally which is a CCIU work, and tr uh, tracing uh, the the other project which which influenced which were influenced by the CCIU work. They have that would be um, awesome. yeah. I have uh, recordings of the seminars, the slides, and the readings, and I will post them on. I will share the links to them on uh, in the classroom. Lovely, because I just read his review of Intelligence and Spirit, and that was also pretty pretty interesting. So yeah, he just he just sent me the stuff for free where it had, would have cost eighty dollar to to access this, and I asked him if I could share it with you, and he let like, yeah, no problem. Phenomenal. That's that's fantastic. That will be very helpful. Okay, so I think we're well uh, overdrafted now. So it's a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Bye. 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 I hope you enjoy your like whole day ahead of <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you everybody. Cheers. Thank you.